First item of business this afternoon is Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Questions. Uh, question 1, Nigel Dawn. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body how it allocates room resources between MSP events and SCPB events. Liam McArthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, annually, there are approximately 380 events um, at the Scottish Parliament. Of these, approximately 340 are member-sponsored events and the remaining uh, sponsored by Scotland's Futures Forum and the SPCB. SPCB events do not take precedence, but as major events can impact on a number of venues within the Parliament, they are agreed and planned up to a year in advance with resources allocated accordingly. The majority of major events take place on Mondays and Fridays and occasionally in the case of receptions on a Wednesday evening. As such, they should have minimal impact on member-sponsored events. However, if a room booked for an SPCB event is needed for a member-sponsored event, parliamentary officials will work with members' offices uh, to try and find a suitable alternative room uh, and or date for their event. Thanks, Nigel Don. Thank you very much, and I, I want to thank Lee MacArthur for that very helpful comment uh, and, uh, and answer, which does, I think, make the point that the SCPB just try to keep out of MSP's ways. However, that's not the way it currently feels. Um, when we go looking for a room many months in advance, it's not unusual to be told that the SCPB has, for some reason or other, booked it. Um, the other thing that I think I would want to bring up, because I'm con conscious that Christine Graham's coming later, um, is, is that we do seem to have an, had a number of substantial events which I wouldn't want to criticise, but they seem to have occurred in term time when perhaps they could have occurred for the public's benefit just as well during holiday time, if I can put it that way. And I wonder whether we might just reallocate our time. Thank you. MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hear what Nigel uh, Dawn has said. I think in terms of room reservations, there is a, a system where uh, rooms are reserved in advance for member-sponsored events so that if a member wishes uh, to hold an event to engage with external organisations and members of the public, we're able to take that event forward. I think in terms of the, the, uh, the, the larger scale uh, major events, as I said in my earlier response, we do try to look at that a year in advance simply because of the logistical uh, uh, questions that need to be uh, resolved. If there are specific cases um, that uh, Mr Dawn wishes to, to bring to the SPCB's attention, we'd certainly be uh, happy to look at those. But I think in terms of the general principle, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, obviously we've set great store and attached a great value to the openness and accessibility uh, of this building. And I think uh, all members uh, uh, would uh, tend to subscribe to the, to the notion that we need to uh, safeguard that. And therefore, I think the major events do play their part in, in, in allowing uh, a wide range of, of people from across Scotland uh, access to uh, not just the building, but also uh, to members of the Scottish Parliament as well. But if there are specific concerns that Nigel Dawn has experienced in terms of uh, his own attempts to, to hold uh, events in the Parliament. We'd be more than happy to look at those. Many thanks. Question two, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I ask the corporate body what progress it has made on promoting sustainable travel and reducing reliance on aviation and the use of private cars? Ms Scanlon. Uh, as we say in our environmental policy, the SBCB is committed to promoting sustainable travel for business and commuting. We're also committed to reducing our carbon footprint by 42% by 2020. And by the end of March 2013, emissions had been reduced by 25%. Emissions from business travel have uh, reduced by 21% since 2005, and aviation emissions have reduced from a high of 280 tonnes carbon dioxide equivalent in 2010 to 131 tonnes last financial year. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful for the answer. I, by happy coincidence, I'm asking this on the day that Transform Scotland have published a report on the public sector's uh, sustainable transport practices in which they find a pretty poor uh, performance overall. If the Scottish Parliament intends to give leadership on this issue within the wider public sector, is it really uh, you know, acceptable that every single committee visit to Brussels has used aviation as the default, has not even uh, expressed a, an environmental impact assessment considering rail as an option when Brussels is so easily reachable by rail? 
I think the, the, the member makes uh, some good points. I, I'm sure he'll understand that uh, I don't have the Transport Scotland document, but I do think it's worth reading. I think it's a point that we could bring forward and discuss on the corporate body. I think that's a constructive point. We could, of course, always do better. Uh, but the SPCB strongly encourages staff not to fly to destinations that can be reached by other forms of transport in a reasonable time scale. Um, uh, it, and I would also add that in 2010, the SPCB conducted a travel to work survey that revealed that 80% of respondents travel to work in a sustainable manner. As I said, we can always do better, and I give Patrick Harvey my commitment that we will look at the document and just see what, uh, and under which areas we can improve our progress. Many thanks. Question three, Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body whether it plans to use committee rooms for exhibitions on a regular basis. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. No, there are no current plans to use committee rooms on a regular basis for exhibitions. Christine Graham. Well, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to hear it because one of the key remit to the corporate body is that a corporate body and its staff is to make sure the Scottish Parliament can operate effectively and that MSPs are able to carry out their duties. Yet recently, the Justice Committee was relegated to this chamber to take key evidence. I was sitting Labour benches. My committee members were the corporate body as the witnesses where Jackson Carlo is. It was with great difficulty, while a committee at that time was allocated an exhibition. So it would appear to me the key priority then was the exhibition. However, in case I'm considered particularly grumpy or indeed a spoil sport, it did cross my mind that this chamber would make an excellent venue for seek de Soleil, just a suggestion, and it might even determine the safety of those beams. Uh, Linda can, Fabiani. Can I say, presiding officer, it would never cross my mind to describe Christine Graham as particularly grumpy. <laughs> Um, what I would say, though, is I, I believe very strongly that another remit of this Parliament is openness and accessibility to the public. And I, I think the exhibition that's been talked about was the, the Andy Warhol Pop Power and Politics exhibition. Um, that was announced in April this year. There are many reasons um, why it was held in Committee Room 1. And I think as the first Parliament in the world to host that exhibition, it's something we should be very, very proud of. And no committee meetings were cancelled uh, because of that exhibition. Um, but, you know, over 22,500 people visited it during the 30 days. And over 500 people participated in the screen printing workshops. I believe that that is a great triumph for this parliament. And I can, on behalf of my SPCB colleagues, we will stand by our belief that it was an excellent exhibition to have and a good example of our parliament being accessible and encouraging to the public. Christine Graham, another supplementary. Uh, yes, thank you, Deputy President. Can I quite agree that it was an excellent exhibition? That's not the question and point. The question and point is the key priority is to allow MSPs to carry out their duties effectively. By deposing us and placing us in the chamber out of a committee room, these priorities were changed. And I, quite frankly, don't want to see it happen again. Linda Fabian. As I said earlier, presiding officer, there are no current plans um, at all to use committee rooms on a regular basis. As I will repeat, no committee didn't meet because of that exhibition. And I would have thought that this chamber was an excellent place uh, to reflect the importance of our committees and to meet here. Okay, thank you. John Wilson, question four. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body how much it has spent on cyclical and reactive building maintenance in each year since 2010. Fabiani. Uh, yes, I, I have these figures and uh, I can certainly pass them on to, to Mr Wilson after this session. Um, we include cyclical maintenance in our planned maintenance figure. Um, for 12-13 it was 1.52 million. Uh, which was the same as the year 11-12, and in the year 10-11, it was 1.56 million. Uh, reactive maintenance for the same period in the first of these three years was 233,000, 11-12 uh, was 158,000, and 12-13 it was 179,000. Thank you. John Wilson. I thank the corporate body for that response. I'm almost tempted to ask when the koi carp are going to be installed in the garden, the water feature in the garden lobby roof. 
uh, as we know that there's a great deal of water lying in that uh, surface water lying on the roof at the present moment. However, um, the question I'd like to follow up with, uh, could I ask the corporate body whether or not there are any major works planned in the foreseeable future, similar to that of the security screening uh, facility that may require planning permission? Linda Fabiani. No, there, there is nothing like this planned. Uh, the security screening, as has been reported to the Parliament already, uh, is now complete and came in uh, on cost um, and on time scale. So we're pleased at that and it's being seen as a welcome addition to our Parliament. Uh, ongoing um, maintenance, cyclical maintenance, planned maintenance as well of, as reactive, um, of course, goes on day to day, week to week, year to year. Um, I don't have in front of me uh, the plans over the next few years, but there are certainly no major capital items that would require planning permission uh, planned at this moment. Hey, thanks. Question five, Dennis Roberts. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the SPCB how many disabled persons' parking spaces we have in Parliament and are their use monitored? Fabiani. Yes, Presiding Officer. Um, the Scottish Parliament corporate body has six parking spaces for disabled people, and uh, these are booked and monitored through the FM Help Desk. There is also, of course, a disabled parking space out in the street across the road from the Parliament entrance, which can be used by visitors. Oh, yeah, I thank the thank member you, Dennis for, Robertson. I, I thank the member for that response. Uh, as the member may know, I, I'm taking forward a private member's bill on the Blue Badge Scheme. I hope that this, this Parliament can be an exemplar uh, in terms of ensuring that disabled parking spaces are only used by appropriate blue badge holders. Uh, so I do actually do request that it is continued monitored so we can actually be an exemplar. Thank you. Linda Fabiani. Yes, Presiding Officer, uh, Dennis Robertson is quite right. We would like this Parliament to be an exemplar. Um, a recent um, example would be where one of our members was hosting a group that had quite a few disabled persons in it. And we were able to arrange that the car park for the Parliament could be used. In a general sense, um, if disabled persons parking bays, the six down in the, the car park, are not booked by noon, um, they are sometimes released for general booking for the following day. Uh, but I would like to stress that this is monitored very, very carefully and will continue to be monitored very, very carefully because it's such an important issue. Dennis Robertson um, is right in bringing it up, especially in the light of his private member's bill, and we should be always held as an example. Many thanks. And that concludes questions to the corporate body. And we'll now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 8422, in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on the independent expert review of opioid replacement therapies in Scotland. I'd invite members who wish to speak in this debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible to locate their microphones effectively, remembering that these are directional microphones. And Minister, when you are ready, I'd call on you to speak in this debate and move the motion in your name at that time. And you have 14 minutes as soon as you are ready to proceed. Uh, thank you, thank you Presiding Officer. Um, it would be useful, I think, to remind the Chamber of the background to this afternoon's debate. In August last year, National Statistics reported that in 2011, drug-related deaths reached the highest level recorded. 584 people in Scotland lost their lives to drugs and for the first time ever, methadone was implicated in more deaths than heroin. These deaths affected and continue to affect friends, families and communities. And that is why I asked the Chief Medical Officer, Sir Harry Burns, to commission an independent expert group on opioid replacement therapies. The expert group published their report, Delivering Recovery Opioid Replacement Therapies in Scotland, in August. My thanks go to Sir Harry Burns, Dr Brian Kidd, who was the chair of the group, and Drs Charles Lind and Kennedy Roberts, who undertook the research for their drive and determination in producing this report. And I also extend my thanks to everyone, including members of this chamber, who contributed uh, to that process. 
The report provides recommendations on both the delivery of opioid replacement therapies in Scotland as well as the wider delivery landscape. It looks at themes including social exclusion and health inequalities, recovery, governance and accountability, information research and evaluation, and the improvement approach needed to drive change. And today, the Minister for Public Health and myself will provide a cross-government response uh, to this report. Since the report's publication, the government has, in fact, held two events, providing those working in alcohol and drug partnerships, primary and secondary care, with an opportunity to reflect on the report. As you're aware, some of the report's recommendations refer to the NHS, uh, and although I will touch on some of those, Mr Matheson will provide more detail about how we're responding to these later uh, this afternoon. First of all, I'd like to ensure that everyone is aware of the headline finding in the report. Last year's drug-related death figures resulted in media coverage questioning the use of methadone. However, the expert group concluded that opiate replacement therapies have a strong evidence base, should be retained in Scottish services, and should be delivered as part of a coherent person-centred recovery plan. The report is clear, however, that methadone, like other treatments, whether residential rehabilitation, community detoxification or psychiatric support, only has a place in the context of recovery. In practice, recovery is best realised through the development of recovery-oriented systems of care. And this is a term used frequently in the report by which they mean a system that enables people to progress at their own pace with a planned and integrated care pathway from their first entry into services to their return to non-specialist services. And with this in mind, the government has been developing an alcohol and drugs quality improvement framework. This will ensure quality in the provision of care, treatment and recovery services as well as quality in the data that will evidence the outcomes people are achieving. And this framework is aligned with the themes uh, outlined in the report. Following collaboration with service users, people in recovery and delivery partners, we are also about to consult with Scotland's 30 ADPs on the development of quality principles embedded in a human rights approach for drug and alcohol services. While we've achieved huge success in reducing waiting times, with the latest statistics showing that 96% of people started treatment for their drug problem within three weeks or less compared to 2007, when people could wait over a year for an appointment, quick access to treatment is the least we can do. The quality principles I am referring to will set out what someone accessing a service can expect to achieve and will be measurable at service, local and national level. They include high quality evidence-based interventions, uh, workers who are appropriately trained and supervised, full strengths-based assessments and person-centered recovery plans that are agreed and regularly reviewed, and if helpful to the individual, the opportunity for their family to be involved. We know that some areas are doing this already, and examples of good practice were highlighted in the report. But delivering quality also depends on the availability of robust information that is capable of demonstrating recovery outcomes. Access to meaningful and reliable information is essential if ADPs and local services are to monitor their progress in delivering recovery. We're currently working with NHS Information Services Division Scotland and ADPs to scope out the development of an integrated drug and alcohol information system. The proposed system will integrate the existing waiting times database and drug misuse database, as well as gathering information on alcohol treatment and recovery indicators. And we're also working with members of the expert group via the Independent Drug Strategy Delivery Commission to explore the feasibility of agreeing key priorities for research on substance use in Scotland. However, it was four years ago that together with NHS Scotland and COSLA, uh, the Scottish Government created ADPs. This report tells us that there are real concerns around the lack of progress found in many ADPs in delivering recovery. We must not be complacent, but ensure that governance and accountability are robust within these structures. The government is committed to working with current expert advisory structures on drugs to review their impact, performance and lines of accountability. But we've already taken steps to improve the accountability of ADPs. 
Planning and reporting mechanisms have been developed and agreed, and in order to drive performance locally, I set ministerial priorities for all ADPs to report on in their annual reports. These include the delivery of the heat standard to maintain fast access for treatment, increasing levels of compliance with the Scottish Drugs Misuse Database, sustaining the quality of data in the National Drug and Alcohol Treatment Waiting Times Database, and increasing the number of take-home naloxone kits supplied to those at risk of opiate overdose. And those, those uh, pieces of information have to be supplied on an annual basis. ADPs have taken these priorities seriously and have committed to taking forward these areas identified for improvement. And for example, over the last six months, the number of take-home naloxone supplies that have been distributed have indeed increased. Our focus on improvement is crucial Last month, I met with ADP chairs and urged them to set an improvement goal that sets out specifically how they will respond to the independent report. For example, West Lothian ADP have stated that by, Dece by December 2016, 100% of people who receive substitute prescribing will be reviewed and will have a recovery plan in place. And Edinburgh ADP will increase the proportion of people who are linked, not just referred, but linked to recovery communities and or mutual aid groups following a planned discharge from specialist treatment by 30% in 2014-15. Now, these examples do demonstrate that a real change is taking place, a result of this government's alcohol and drug quality improvement programme and the expert group report on which we have already begun to act. However, it is important to remember that people affected by drugs are extremely vulnerable and are often experiencing other significant health conditions including the effects of ageing. The evidence also tells us that stigma is a significant barrier to delivering recovery. The Chief Medical Officer recognised this in his foreword to the expert group's report and highlighted that overcoming stigma and further increasing the number of people in recovery will be challenging but achievable. Those are his words. In line with government priorities, the report emphasises the importance of workforce development, not only in upskilling, but in addressing stigma and attitudes towards drug use and recovery, and by that I mean even within some of the wider workforces dealing with people who are uh, using drugs. And I should make it clear that means challenging those attitudes, and that's the attitudes of the professionals themselves that are sometimes being experienced. STRADA, our nationally commissioned workforce development agency, are currently working with ADPs to support them identify training needs around the development of recovery-oriented systems of care. In addition, the Scottish Recovery Consortium delivers recovery workshops for treatment providers, giving opportunities for workers to connect with people's own experiences of recovery, as well as learning about recovery tools and practices that are used elsewhere in Scotland. And by taking this work across the country, I'm delighted that the Recovery Consortium will be working with all addiction staff in NHS Ayrshire and Arran in the coming months. The report makes recommendations on the quality, consistency and availability of drug treatment services within Scotland's health service. Inconsistency was reported to be driven by the opt-in nature of the GP contracting process for substance use treatment. And to increase consistency, the report calls for discussions within primary care and pharmacy about the delivery of drug treatment services and suggests the development of national standards for primary care and community pharmacy. Now, this government has increased the number of GPs in Scotland. We have more GPs per head of population than the rest of the UK. We're leading the way with the world's first patient safety programme for primary care, and we have invested more than £757 million to deliver primary care services last year, an increase of more than 17% since 2004. John Finney. Are taking an intervention. Would the Minister acknowledge that there needs to be uniformity of services and there can't be any areas where there's an opt-out due to public perceptions of treatment for people uh, in drug programmes? Minister. There, there is always going to be a challenge delivering uniformity of services, particularly across a wide range of services, many of which are effectively designed to be responsive to local uh, uh, needs and conditions, uh, uh, but also that involve a variety of different pre professional groups and uh, professional interests. So it is a, it is a challenge uh, and uh, uh, it, it is one that we need to work very uh, uh, hard um, 
uh, to overcome. But I think we need to remember that patient care is provided by the whole clinical team, not just by GPs. Uh, GPs use their professional judgment to work with patients uh, to agree the best and most appropriate care to support the general health of individuals, including their recovery from drug use. In delivering care for their patients, GPs should take account of all aspects affecting a patient's care and, where necessary, actively link with specialist services to deliver the care required. And the report does not make light of the role of pharmacists in delivering uh, recovery. Since the group's report was published, the government published Prescription for Excellence in September. This is our 10-year vision and action plan for pharmaceutical care in Scotland. It gives a firm commitment to work with pharmacists and other healthcare professionals to develop and implement new NHS standard specifications for drug and alcohol services. And the expert group's report will build on work already taking place in NHS boards and will inform the development uh, of this work. And at the event held with healthcare, healthcare professionals just this month, the Minister for Public Health and myself made individual commitments to how both of us can better engage with the NHS. I committed to bringing together relevant healthcare professionals uh, each year to ensure that people with drug problems are supported in their recovery. And the Minister for Public Health committed to identifying an accountable officer from every NHS board to be responsible for the, of, uh, the delivery of opiate replacement therapies in local areas. Mr Matheson uh, will provide more information on this uh, later. But I also want to take this opportunity to reassure the Chamber that recovery is alive across Scotland. Last year, I announced the development of a recovery initiative fund. Since then, almost £100,000 has been distributed to individuals and recovery communities. Examples of successful applicants include the Unity Recovery Football Club, a Glaswegian football group consisting of people in recovery and their families, uh, and Hectic Life Edinburgh, a social enterprise whose aim is to provide training and permanent work for individuals in recovery from addiction through furniture building, restoration and recycling. And of course, meaningful uh, work and meaningful activity is extremely important uh, when we're talking about recovery. I've also had the privilege of attending five-year anniversary events of the Road to Recovery strategy, where not only have we discussed what still needs to be done, uh, but the achievements made since the introduction of the Road to Recovery strategy in 2008. And I think members have all been sent a copy of the story so far, which reflects on how things have changed in Scotland in the last five years. And while we mustn't be complacent about the improvements that still need to be made, I would like to finish with a quote from the story so far that I think summarises where we are today. Momentum is building, and I hope that in five years' time we will have reached a tipping point that washes all the unhelpful stigma and moral rhetoric away. I appreciate that sometimes we can be seen as naive optimists and know that living can be tough whoever you are, whatever demographic, social, economic situation you're in, but it is right to pursue recovery in this way at this time, in an inclusive and hopeful way, and it is working. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Dr Elaine Murray to speak to and move Amendment 8422.1. Dr Murray, 10 minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and in case I forget to do so later on, I will start by moving the amendment in my name, and I welcome the opportunity to debate the findings of the independent report into OPA. Uh, replacement therapies. So it feels as if it's been a long time in coming. It was announced in October last year and at that time the recommendations were supposed to be produced by spring. But nevertheless, I am pleased that we are at last discussing the important and often contentious issues of the treatment of people suffering from heroin addiction. Labour members welcome the acknowledgement in the government motion of the concerns contained in the report, which raises many important issues about how services are currently delivered across Scotland. Now, I'm not arguing that all these issues fall at the feet of government, but the report does place the responsibility on government to provide leadership in using 11 of the recommendations to form the basis of what it terms, and I quote, an immediate improvement programme. We feel that more urgency is required than is actually displayed in the government's motion today. Importantly, the report identifies that opioid replacement therapy is an essential service with a strong evidence base, and I repeat what the Minister has said earlier. This has been verified through research in a number of countries across the world. Amongst the report's recommendations are a more coordinated approach from all service providers to tackle the effects of health inequality and stigma, that ORT should be offered in the context of a flexible and mixed treatment system, that therapy should be part of a person-centred recovery programme with a care pathway and the progress of individuals able to be objectively determined. 
There was a clear and significant concern about the performance of alcohol and drug partnerships across the country and a need for their functions to be reviewed, as some displayed little evidence of a real impetus towards recovery and a lack of progress towards recovery-oriented systems of care or rocks and quality insurance. The report notes that there is an urgent need to address what it calls the lack of institutional memory in planning, delivery and governance. And I imagine that is some form of management speak for a failure to learn from past mistakes or instances of good practice. There's also a lack of accountability, including lines of accountability to the Scottish Government, and the need for an approach which has a track record of delivery of change. Indeed, there's a lack of outcome measurement at the moment, with even the very modest SMR 25B follow-up forms not completed in the majority of clients. Research and academic inquiry was also noted to have been poorly developed in Scotland. Our amendment focuses on the need to make real progress on the issues identified in the report and to demonstrate commitment to that by determining a, a timetable for action on the improvements identified as being required. The report notes that the average age of a heroin user is, user is increasing. Heroin does not seem to be the drug of choice of younger people. It is not seen as cool now. That is good. But it also may be due to the easy availability of so-called legal highs, which of course may bring many dangers, such as extreme psychosis, and these also need to be the subject of scrutiny and perhaps a separate debate. But the increasing age of heroin users brings with it problems, as the prolonged use leads to more complex and severe physical and mental health problems. Nor should we assume that the unpopularity of heroin with younger people at the current time indicates that it will eventually fall out of use. I am advised that drug popularity is cyclical and a future generation may not eschew heroin to the extent that young people today do. Now, heroin users do not engender much in the way of public sympathy from the general public. The UK Drugs Policy Commission noted high levels of blame and intolerance amongst the Scottish population and even that, quote, the fear of and need to exclude people with drug, drug problems were higher in Scotland than in the rest of the UK, a finding which the report describes as sobering. Attitudes towards medication-assisted recovery were also more negative in Scotland. And Scotland also has higher rates of harm and premature death than other EU countries. And these rates have not fallen away in the way that they have in other countries. So we do have a challenge here in Scotland. But in addition to stigma, the debate around drug treatments is often ill-informed with a lack of information regarding treatments available and what is actually meant by recovery. The lack of a shared definition of recovery is noted in the report. And while there is a definition in the road to recovery, which recognises that recovery is about voluntarily moving on from problem drug use, and there's the UK DPC consensus statement on recovery, these definitions do not seem to be universally accepted or understood, with the perception that, that recovery equates to having achieved abstinence. Now, of course, that is the goal for many, many heroin users and their families, and as indeed it should be. Where it is possible for a user to become drug free, that should be the aim and efforts and support should be directed towards that aim. But for some, it will not be totally possible to cease uh, opioid tra treatment, uh, uh, replacement treatment because some people are actually too ill ever to be able to come off the medication. And before people criticise that and say, why is the NHS paying for that? We do pay for the consequences of obesity, the consequences of smoking, the consequences of choices that people make, and this is the same uh, issue, I believe. Now, the standard opioid replacement is methadone. Surely. Jim Eady. Thank you, Dr Murray, for taking the intervention. Would you agree with me, though, that um, the attitude, and you were right to highlight the issue of stigma, that people make a lifestyle choice when they choose to misuse drugs actually neglects to... Uh, recognise the fact that often these are people who are in the poorest and most deprived parts of the country and therefore the lifestyle choice isn't uh, the choice that people say it is. Dr Murray. I acknowledge that. Indeed, I'm coming on to that later in my speech myself. Um, the standard opioid replacement is, is methadone, although buprenorphine, also known as suboxane or subutox, is becoming a more common alternative. Uh, in mo most ADP areas, only one patient in 20 still is prescribed buprenorphine. However, in two of our ADP areas, it is one in three. Uh, and quote, well, clearly, that is a clinical decision. Uh, Hopefully, it's not based on the fact that buprenorphine is three times as expensive, but also it takes longer to supervise. It's easier con to conceal because it's a tablet that can be concealed under the, tab the tongue. And it's also harsher on the, us the user as he or she remains totally sober, and they have to be psychologically and physically robust enough to tolerate its use. However, there must be something to be learned about its use from those two ADP areas which pres prescribe it so much more fr uh, frequently because it's important that users wanting to progress into recovery and hopefully into abstinence should be offered the road 
most suitable for them, whether that be methadone, buprenorphine or abstinence. Now, I want to touch a couple of other issues co uh, contained in the report. The first is the heat target that anyone with a drug problem should wait no more than three weeks uh, for treatment. We believe that this needs to be refined as currently it does not monitor recovery. And although the uh, uh, Scottish Morbidity Records review all clients at three months and then annually or upon discharge, in 12 ADP areas, they fail to follow up on these reviews in over 50% of cases because delayed data collection is not mandatory. Uh, and the heat target, therefore, should be person-centred and based on recovery rather than just access to treatment. The report also points out that less than half of the health boards in Scotland can offer any access to specialist addiction psychology, psychology services. Now, considering the problems we have in Scotland with addiction, whether it's alcohol, smoking, gambling, eating disorders, as well as a drug abuse, I find this very worrying. And I hope it is not indicative of too low a priority accorded to mental health services. An estimated £36 million is spent annually on substance misuse services in Scotland. The Independent Review Group estimates that when all the services and agencies are taken into account, justice, child protection, social services, etc., the total cost of drug addiction to the public sector in Scotland could be almost 100 times that amount, £3.5 billion. And with that sum of public money of that magnitude, we do need to get our act together to develop a more effective response to drug abuse. We must also use early intervention to support vulnerable ind individuals and prevent them from getting on the road to substance abuse in the first place. Because, as Jamedi referred to, drug abusers often have experienced trauma, sometimes in childhood, perhaps through parental drug or alcohol abuse, family breakdown, a parent in prison, the death of a key family me member, sexual and domestic abuse, and poor engagement with education and social services. Many have had problematic relationships with alcohol in their early teens before moving on to misusing other substances. Some indeed have had trauma in later life, including many leaving the armed forces. So identification of and support for people at risk of self-medicating with alcohol or drugs would save them and their families an awful lot of misery, as well as saving the public sector significant costs across a whole range of services. So that is why our amendment states that the strategy should include prevention, stopping drug use from the starting from starting by identifying and supporting those who are vulnerable to its attractions. I think that is very important. Finally, our amendment changes the phrase of the final phrase of the government's motion, and it may be the way I read it, but it appears to recognise the contribution and role of the health service workforce, but it doesn't include all those other people outside the NHS, many in the voluntary sector, who also make a vital contribution to the support and recovery of drug users. You can think of people like the Scottish Drugs Forum in my own constituency, there's First Space, a whole load of people in the third sector who make an extremely co uh, important contribution in a variety of different ways. So I hope that members will be persuaded so, to support our motion tonight, which adds on uh, to the government's own amendment. Thank you. Right. Many thanks. I now call on Mary Scanlon. Six minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I am delighted <coughs> excuse me, to speak in this debate on the independent expert review of opioid uh, replacement therapies. And can I say to the Minister in the most constructive way, uh, perhaps she wasn't uh, sure that I was speaking in this debate, I haven't been doing in recent times, but I would have found it very helpful to have had the government response uh, prior to the debate today. <laughs> Um, but having been a member of the Health Committee for many years and also a member of the cross-party groups on drug and alcohol as far back as 1999, I have to say that I fully supported the road to recovery, as did my colleague uh, uh, Annabel Goldie. Uh, and I, uh, on that basis, I very much welcome what the Minister has said today about the emphasis on outcomes and the quality principles uh, for ADTs and also what a person can expect to achieve, as well as the family involvement and the uh, naloxone. There was very little that she said uh, that I didn't uh, welcome today, and I think that's very positive. I would also acknowledge that there's no exact overlap between the Road to Recovery and the independent expert group uh, on ORT that we're debating today. Uh, given that the Road to Recovery looked at uh, recovery, delivery and prevention, and today we are focusing on opioid replacement therapy. However, five and a half years after the Road to Recovery, I have to say that the progress that we all expected and supported on every side of this chamber has been disappointing, to say the least. Uh, and what's even more disappointing is that many of the themes and recommendations we are debating today were made in 2008. 
Uh, and so, I, although I welcome the, what's been said today, I think that what I would like to ask for is more regular updates on the progress uh, of the action taken. More information on the response to treatment would allow treatment services to be benchmarked. It would support transparency of the effectiveness of interventions being supplied to patients. For example, does everyone on the methadone script get a monthly test to determine the presence of illegal drugs? Not sure. Government statistics for the quarter to June this year stated that 96% of people attended an appointment for drug treatment within three weeks. Now, I welcome that, but it's not within, it's what happens after the three weeks. And I, I, I welcome what the Minister said today, but that is the target we have just now. So I commend the focus given today on the outcomes and not just the three weeks uh, for turning up to, uh, to the first appointment. There is much good practice out there, uh, and one would appear to be North East and South Ayrshire, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, their Alcohol and Drug Partnership piloted a methadone cessation programme aimed at supporting long-term methadone users over a period of six months. And given the information we have, this is an example of a programme that undoubtedly has seen some notable success. But in looking back uh, to some of the questions I've submitted on this issue, I found one from the Health Minister Ian Gray in 2001, which states that, and I quote, drug users often claim that methadone is harder to come off than heroin. I'm not sure that's always understood. And I say that uh, because I think that we need to listen to those who are addicted to drugs, we need to listen to those who are in recovery, those who are having difficulties addressing their drug usage, and I welcome the inclusion of families. But as I said, uh, the, when I looked at the road to recovery and today, uh, the, the review today says there are still huge inconsistencies across the country in terms of the availability of treatment or the range of quality of care and there was little evidence presented by some ADPs regarding a real impetus towards recovery. Well, this was raised in, by Audit Scotland, Drugs and Alcohol Services in 2009. It was also the conclusion of a cross-party health committee report that Michael Matheson and I sat on in the last session of Parliament. And in the Road to, road to Recovery, five and a half years ago, it states that there were serious shortcomings in a number of ADATs. That was in 2008. So what we have today is not new. I welcome the commitment and the focus, but I don't want to wait another five and a half years and see the same problems coming forward again. Again, uh, one of the themes, health inequalities. The Road to Recovery stated, an appropriate range of drug treatment and rehab services to promote recovery and better integration of medical treatment with mental health. That's what we've heard today. We knew that was a problem five and a half years ago. Another theme today, lack of institutional memory and an agreed understanding of the key issues and plans. And without this, systems are destined to continue repeating mistakes. Road to recovery, Agreed understanding and collaboration is a central theme. And then uh, theme five today, urgent need to develop meaningful information system. That was also in the road to recovery. And again, in the road to recovery, I could find 10 actions to support the setting up of a new national drug strategy website to bring together all the policy and research uh, in place for uh, academics, pr practitioners, key experts, service users and the public. Oh, I've got the same today. So, uh, providing officer, all I would say is I do welcome what the Minister has come forward with today. I welcome the focus on outcomes, but I would also ask if she would work with us because she has the support across this chamber to provide regular updates on progress. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate, and I call on Jim Eady to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Six minutes, up to six minutes, please. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The issue of substance misuse is a complex one, but we must always have at the forefront of our discussions the fact that this is about people's lives, the lives of those who are recovering from substance misuse, their families and the communities in which they live. Now, the causes of substance misuse are multifaceted. Tackling it, therefore, requires a strategic approach with all of the relevant government departments, agencies and organisations working together to achieve what I believe are the shared objectives of recovery, harm reduction and prevention. We also need to ensure that all of this necessary activity and service provision is underpinned by high-quality evidence-based practice. Opiate replacement therapies have a strong evidence base, as was recognised by the Independent Expert Review. And Dr Brian Kidd, the Chair of the Drug Strategy Delivery Commission, stated, We have concluded that ORT with methadone is an effective treatment and must remain a significant element of the treatment options available for those struggling with opiate dependency in Scotland. However, ORT must be one of a comprehensive range of treatment options in every area. The expert review highlights the fact that systematic reviews have concluded that ORT is associated with improved retention in treatment, reduced o illicit opioid and heroin use, and reduced HIV and bloodborne virus risk behaviours, which are related to injecting. The conclusion of the review was clear. ORT should be retained in Scottish services and they should be delivered as part of a coherent person-centred recovery plan. Another requirement in tackling these issues is the need for national leadership. And here I do pay tribute to the work of the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and the Minister for Public Health for the constructive and inclusive way in which they have taken matters forward. Of course, the context for today's debate, as Mary Scanlon reminded us, is the national drug strategy, The Road to Recovery. That strategy was published in 2008 by the Scottish Government, but it has been endorsed by the Parliament and it commands widespread support across all of the relevant agencies and organisations organisations delivering services as being the right approach for addressing Scotland's legacy of drug misuse. It states, central to the strategy is a new approach to tackling problem drug use based firmly on the concept of recovery. Recovery is a process through which an individual is enabled to move on from their problem drug use towards a drug-free life and become an active and contributing member of society. The key phrase is towards a drug-free life. There has to be an acceptance and an understanding that someone who has a history of drug misuse will, in many cases, if not the majority of cases, simply not be able to become drug-free overnight, even if being drug-free is the ultimate objective. Presiding officer, the dichotomy with which we are sometimes presented between abstinence on the one hand and harm reduction on the other is a false one. And this was a point made effectively by the United, yes, by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in its report in 2009. Penny Scanlon. I thank the member for giving way. Would the member also acknowledge that uh, quite often the, diff the, the problem is that there is an underlying mental health problem and what is required is a dual diagnosis and the psychological support, not only the detox and rehab? I, I absolutely yeah, agree with the point uh, made by the member. And I'm come on. Uh, to, to discuss uh, mental health in a moment. One of the barriers to accessing services and achieving recovery is the stigma which exists towards uh, current and former drug users and their families. And this was a point highlighted by uh, the expert review and again this afternoon by the Minister and by Dr Murray. It also goes on to make the sobering observation that such stigma is endemic at all levels in society. Let's pause for a moment to consider what that means. It means that some of the most vulnerable people are not accessing services and it means that they may be more at risk from premature death. Sobering indeed. Now, there has been a transformation in attitudes towards people with mental health problems in our society. Wouldn't it be uh, equally um, satisfying if we were to see similar changes in public attitudes towards people who are recovering from drug misuse? If stigma is endemic within our society, then it would be naive to believe that negative attitudes do not exist on the part of some professionals involved in providing addiction services. I was told by someone with significant experience within this field of the views of one service user who told him, I go to services as an addict and I get punished as an addict. Therefore, there is a clear challenge to the NHS and other agencies to ensure that there is appropriate training and continuing professional development for all staff who work within services designed to assist people on their recovery journey. The evidence tells us that recovery is most effective when service users' needs and aspirations are placed at the centre of their care and treatment. 
The role of community pharmacy featured prominently in the review and was endorsed as making an absolutely vital contribution to the provision of high quality care for substance misuse patients. And a number of recommendations in the review I think will help uh, to improve uh, the provision of services in this area. I would also like to pay tribute in the final minute to the work of the Scottish Drugs Forum, the work that they undertake to harness the talents, experience and skills of service users themselves to improve the quality of services, promote employability and support individual recovery. There are a number of challenges in this report if we are to bring about improvements in the provision of services covering a range of areas. The aim must be to minimise what people need to recover from and maximise what they can recover to. Presiding officer, in conclusion, this review provides yet further supporting evidence to underpin the important role of ORT in tackling drug misuse. It identifies areas where further improvement must be made and it provides a valuable platform which will allow many more people with substance use problems to achieve good outcomes. That is something which all of us in this chamber should unite to support. Many thanks. Now call on Anne McTaggart to be followed by Sandra White. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm keen to contribute to the important debate on the subject of the review of opioid replacement therapies in Scotland. In my region of Glasgow, this issue is of particular importance and affects thousands of families struggling with addiction and substance dependency issues. I am confident that members across this chamber will agree that opioid replacements like methadone can, in particular circumstances, help stabilise drug users and direct them away from most harmful of illegal drugs. However, I am also confident that we could be doing much more to help addicts to dispose of the drug habit altogether with use of greater community recovery resources. At a short, as a short-term solution, I believe methadone can act as an effective intervention that removes the individual from the dependency and other substances and the lifestyle associated with acquiring it. However, a longer-term strategy will need to address the social, economic and medical reasons behind the process of addiction to drugs like ecstasy, cocaine and heroin. The most effective strategy will not be medical, but will reflect on the reasons why people become addicted, as well as providing individuals with a route out of their addiction altogether. Quite fundamentally, presiding officer, this will mean effectively tackling problems like poverty, unemployment, homelessness and crime. The harsh reality is that there is no one solution that will comprehensively eradicate the harm caused by drug addiction and serious investment is required in a number of areas to impact more greatly on the lives of those most affected. I welcome the findings of this review into opioid replacement therapies, which will attempt to prioritise recovery from addiction and will aim to work more consistently with grassroots agencies right across the country. What I will still like to see from the Scottish Government is a timetable that will outline the action being taken to provide clear and effective routes from addiction to recovery. It is not just drug users that depend on the support of key agencies and services, but their families and their wider community, all of whom are affected by the criminal behaviour that facilitates the traffic of drugs into Scotland. Working within the field of addiction for the last 20 years in various roles and projects, and lastly as a former social work professional in Glasgow City Council, I know that the, one of the, the, the drug treatment and testing orders can play uh, an important role in helping deal with drug-related crime, which is also highlighted within the report. However, my experience has taught me that we need to use them better as part of a joined up system that supports addicts to overcome their addiction. Very often, drug treatment and testing orders are too little, too late, and are handed down to individuals who are ready, already well acquainted with the life of hard drugs and the criminal behaviour required to pay for them. We need to be smarter about when we intervene with drug users, and in my view, that should be as early as possible. Our agencies should be working within the local communities where drug dependency is known to be high, and they should be carrying out preventative work with young people in schools and youth centres. 
For established users, our systems need to be effective at helping those who combine a number of drugs as well as those who misuse alcohol on top of drugs. It is a mistake to oversimplify this problem by isolating substances and neglecting the pattern of abuse that for too long has ruined lives and families. Presiding officer, we know that drug deaths in Scotland are too high. I will work with the Scottish Government to tackle this tragic reality and commend the basic principles of the report of ORT. I urge the Government to look more widely at the issues that we face and place an emphasis on the kind of preventative work that will see Scotland a cleaner and safer place to live for our future generations. Many thanks. Now call on Sandra White to be followed by Willie Rennie. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I think we are all aware of the effects of substance abuse on the individual, those close to them and the wider community. Indeed, many of us here will have visited such uh, groups and individuals, families who are looking after their own families and their grandchildren also. And I think Anne McTaggart had actually touched on that particular part. And I think we should all pay tribute to the really hard work and uh, work that they do uh, in regards to their families and, and uh, grandchildren also. Uh, bearing in mind they do it voluntarily <coughs> and basically <coughs> to support uh, families who have uh, a substance uh, misuse problem. Uh, I hope we'll also agree that uh, what these people need is understanding, support, and that by endorsing the experts' group's conclusions and recommendations, we can continue to deliver this understanding and support while continuing to improve upon what is currently being done. Uh, I think to this end, Scotland's 30 alcohol and drug partnerships are of vital importance in delivering these aims, and I do welcome the Minister's announced consultation with the ADPs on the development of quality principles and importantly, very importantly, with a strong commitment to human rights. It is true that in the past, concerns have been expressed that ADPs have not been as transparent as it could be. I think Mary Scanlon raised that particular point. So to see new planning and reporting mechanisms being agreed on, I think it should be encouraging and is very encouraging uh, to all of us. It's also important, though, that they are given the flexibility to develop local strategies uh, as the level of substance misuse and underlying reasons can differ widely across Scotland. And I'm sure everyone here will have different stories to tell of their different uh, constituencies and regions. David Liddle, director of the Scottish Drugs Forum, when commenting on the report, highlighted the fact that significant income and health inequalities underpin much of Scotland's drug problem. And again, Anne McTaggart also raised that in her contribution now, in Glasgow, the prevalence of drug misuse is still considerably higher than the national average, and I believe that this is part due to the inequalities which still exist in that great city and the constituency that I represent. And although tackling this issue may fall out with the remit of this report, it is important to remember that it is an underlying reason. And I do welcome the comments by the Minister regarding health inequalities and the involvement of the Public Health Minister. Uh, and I would encourage joint working, if at all possible, with other Scottish government departments to tackle inequality at all levels. Now, the Minister also spoke of the Recovery Initiative Fund and the Unity Recovery Football Club, which is a great example of local initiatives which supports recovery, but also offers other healthy avenues to give people new interests and a new focus. The fact that it also forms a sense of community amongst those participating is, in my mind, a very, very important aspect of these projects. Uh, there are also many other numbers of projects in Glasgow that have a very much holistic approach to treatment, rather than perhaps more mainstream methods. Just Like Us, based in Milton in Glasgow, is another great example offering a structured 10-week spiritual-based skills programme which focuses on empowering the individuals to take control of their own lives in a very meaningful way and reduce their reliance on prescribed medication. Now, there are plenty more examples of this type of approach, not just in Glasgow, but throughout the country. And I think that they are important to our overall perception and treatment of misuse and perhaps an approach that the Minister would look at including in the Government's future approach to its drug strategy. Another important aspect of support and prevention must be to help people coming out of prison to ensure that they do not simply fall back into substance misuse. 
And unfortunately, in the past, the transition from prison life back into society has seen a number of people go back to past habits, reoffend, and be sent back to prison. And as a member of the Justice Committee, I know only too well from uh, the experience of prisoners and the evidence we've heard that unfortunately is a part of the revolving door. And it is a very much a vicious cycle which must be ended if we are to avoid further drug misuse. Now, the Scottish Government's public social partnerships has been used in Lomos Prison to tackle this issue, to offer support to those leaving prisons to get the necessary support after they leave. And I would like to give you a small example of this. Uh, one user of the partnership, and I do quote uh, his words, there are so many wee things you need to sort out, housing benefits, medicine, and all those wee things that make it feel like it's an uphill struggle from the start. And after leaving prison, he went to his doctor, but had been deregistered and was told he wouldn't get his subby, in his words, his prescription, as he didn't have a fact from the prison. Faced with this, it would have been very easy for him to slip back into the substance misuse. But in his case, the PSP spoke to the doctor and the prison and got things sorted out. Now, it's not an isolated incident, but with the support of the PSP, he was much easier and less to uh, offend again. Now, PSPs have been shown to work, and I wonder if the Minister would consider rolling this model out across Scotland. Uh, I welcome the independent expert review of opioid replacement therapies in Scotland, and that it's hard it promotes a person-centred recovery. The review also highlights the de desire to further develop information, research, and evaluation systems at a national level. And I would encourage the Minister to include in this research the use of holistic approaches to drugs misuse and the use of public social partnerships in achieving the aims of the government's drug strategy. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. Now, Colin, will you ready to be followed by Christian Allard? Um, it's quite remarkable, the change in the debate on this subject compared with last year. And I think it's a really welcome change that we've actually got back to, I think, more of a bit of a consensus about drug misuse. Um, this was probably all sparked off to David Clegg's great delight by the Daily Record, um, who targeted what they called the methadone millionaires. Now, I met Mr. Houlihan, who was the so-called methadone millionaire. And he's a pharmacist who's built up his business, and he works in some of the hardest communities in the west of Scotland. But that is a man, a pharmacist, who I think is, I've never seen more engaged in the interests of the people that he serves. He wants to change their lives, and I was really quite inspired by his commitment to his community. So I didn't recognize him as a methadone millionaire. I think there was a mix up in terms of the profit versus the, the turnover um, on that. But he wasn't somebody who was characterized in the Daily Record as somebody who did not care about the people that he served. It also, this report was inspired by the concern that methadone was triggering a number of deaths um, from drugs. And it should be recognised at the time that many commented, said that this was really about a heroin drought at that period that was forcing drug users to experiment with different types of drugs. And when you experiment, sometimes things can go wrong. It wasn't methadone itself that was the problem. There was wider issues at heart as well. You were also dealing with a group of people who kind of dropped in and out of services, who had chaotic lives. So these kind of um, events, I wouldn't say it's natural to happen, but these events, you could understand the reasons why they did happen. And that's why a superficial look at the figures was not helpful at the time. And I'm glad we've got to the bottom of this and why um, the, the number of deaths were increasing at that time. Because I'm clear that methadone is part of the solution. It's not part of the problem. If you look, compare Russia, with the United Kingdom and with Scotland. Russia, which does not have a similar program in terms of needle exchange and methadone. The bloodborne virus problems in that country are far, far, far greater than we have in this uh, country. So we should recognize the differences that we have made over that time. And I'm glad, therefore, that the Kid Report did endorse this point of view, that methadone was part of the, the solution and not part of the problem. Now, I was recently at the Phoenix Futures graduation ceremony in Glasgow. I was a wee bit daunted, I have to say, by going into the, to the Woodside Halls uh, in Glasgow. There was a lot of people who had, how could I put it, they've seen the hard end of life, many of them with tattoos on their knuckles and various other um, marks. Um, and, but the, what struck me is when I went in was that they were all hugging each other. 
Um, now, these were hard people. These were people who have seen difficult bits of, the, of the, their community, but they were hugging each other. And this, I thought, was a mark of the success of Phoenix Futures, that they have created recovery communities. They're people who look after the emotional side of each other's needs. It's a, it was a tremendous recommendation. They, they were delighted to have graduated um, out of uh, drug misuse. Um, and I think that's the kind of project that we should celebrate. I also attended a project in Kirkcaldy uh, not so long ago, and I met a young man who said he was more frightened of recovery than he was of drug misuse. Now, he was recovering, but he said, having come off drugs, he now saw the world, and he had to face up to all his demons that he had previously managed to hide from in the past. So he said it was actually getting more difficult now being in recovery. So you can understand why people dip in and out of recovery over time. And it's uh, not an easy thing to progress naturally from, from methadone into abstinence. And the, the Scottish Drugs Forum, their conference yesterday, I think, uh, was an excellent event as well, which focused on trauma and its contribution. And I think Jimmy Dee's right about you know, poverty and deprivation are major contributory factors to this, but also traumatic events in people's life, no matter which background they come from, sometimes wealthy backgrounds as well as poor backgrounds. But they were focusing on the effect of trauma, not just one-off events, but longer-term events as well. Um, there is a considerable amount of debate, and I think Elaine Murray was right. There still, probably still is a bit of a debate about what actually recovery, what recovery is. I think there is generally an understanding recovery is improvement. And, and it's different for everybody. Um, some people in the sector view it as complete abstinence as recovery. Um, but I wouldn't say they're the majority. But there is a debate, and I think that's a healthy debate that goes on. Um, when I was at the Phoenix Futures, there was somebody who was saying they condemned methadone. They don't like it at all. They don't like touching it one bit. But the majority of people I meet in the drug misuse community recognise that it's got a role to play. Um, but also that this is not just about medicine. It's also about the mind. It's also about the wider factors in life. The degree of compulsion that should be involved as well. How much do we compel drug users to go forward to treatment? Not that compulsion would ever really be used, but what kind of encouragement? How far do you go along the track from encouragement to compulsion is a critical factor. And then the debate about residential versus community. That is also a lively debate too. Um, the NHS, I think, um, probably needs the biggest shake-up in this, trying to get the NHS in a wider sense to engage properly. This is an issue that affects a whole range of services, from housing, through to health, through to justice. And justice primarily takes the lead, but the NHS needs to take a lead as well. And that's why it's important, I think, that the medical director um, should be the lead person, um, in a second, the lead person in terms of opioid uh, replacement. But we also need a person in the NHS to take a much more comprehensive lead on those issues too. I'll take an intervention from Dennis Robertson. Dennis Robertson, briefly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the member. Um, does the member uh, agree with me that the, uh, the integration of social care and health is perhaps a pathway to um, relieving some of these anxieties? Uh, you should be drawing uh, to a close, please, Mr Rennie. Yes, perhaps. We, we shouldn't necessarily just look for structural changes to actually change minds, because we need to get leading people within the NHS to fully embrace drug misuse and not just leave it to somebody else. Because the, the issues are actually beyond just the simple issue of recovery. Because we need to sort out issues of housing, on work, on family. And one thing that I've increasingly noticed is the issue around about boredom. People are just bored and when, finally. They're, when they're drug misusers. So <laughs> I will come to my conclusion. Uh, I Excellent. think there is finally just a bit of good news is that the number of newer drug users, younger drug users, is dropping. And we should welcome that. It's something that we're moving in the right direction. So a lot of work to do, but we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Many thanks. Now I call on Christian Allard to be followed by Jamie Hepburn. Six minutes. Thank you, President Officer, and I would like to congratulate uh, Willie Rennie for what he said about uh, we are moving in the right uh, direction. And I would like to say that, like many of my generation, I've lost too many friends and family members to drug use. I'm not surprised by the finding that there are more individuals with problem drug use in the 35 to 64 year age group than in the 15 to 34 group. My generation failed to recognize the danger of drug use. The same generation today 
is failing to recover from it. More to the point, many of my generation today are still considering drug use as a recreational habit. Some still claiming that we should have the freedom to choose to use drug, ignoring the cost to society, the human cost when we learn that more than 500 lives a year are lost, are lost to drug use in Scotland. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak on the independent expert review of opioid replacement therapies commissioned by the Chief Medical Officer and led by the Independent Drug Strategy Delivery Commission. As some of you, some of the members already have given some stories about what's happening today. And what I would like to do, because we're talking about an older generation where the biggest problem is, uh, I would like to share with you one of the story of one of my friends back in France before I came here in Scotland. And this person was a, a normal person, as we can say. Somebody, you know, like, like your neighbor. He was a plumber, a young plumber of 18 years old. And he was a kind of person who will look very well after his own flat and very well out of little car. And, and he was uh, very careful of what he was eating. But he loved these recreational drugs he would take all the time. And he will tell me all the time, you know, Christian, you should share it with me. You know, you should try it out. And I always said that it's not something for me, and I always use uh, the same argument that it leads to harder drugs, and he would always dismiss me. And uh, he had a regular life, a regular girlfriend who was a sweetheart of his. Uh, and I, I, I was really, when I left France, it's one of the, one of the friends I, I really missed. A couple of years later, two or three years later, I heard that he had died. And I didn't understand why, so I inquired, and I did discover that he had died of drug overdose. What happened, the silly thing, you know, his sweetheart just left him, and uh, it, everything turned into another one. And he's not one of them who died, you know, with tattoos or having, uh, uh, being, uh, uh, doing anything illegal. Uh, he just uh, died of overdose. This story demonstrates that everyone could be led to believe that using drug is a personal choice. And addiction is extremely difficult to recover from. But this story shows us as well that in them days, you didn't have uh, the same uh, opportunities that you have today. I wish my friend Pascal would have had the same opportunity, but the point replacement, a point replacement uh, we have to the therapies we, we can offer today to the people in Scotland today. The statistics here in Scotland, in my own area in Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire, uh, are showing that the number of drug-related deaths fell between 2011 and 2012. In my region, the northeast of Scotland, recovery communities have been set up. Aberdeen in Recovery was formed by a small group of people in recovery in 2012, supported by Aberdeen City Alcohol and Drugs Partnership to help reduce stigma and to help raise the profile of recovery from addiction to drugs and alcohol. Uh, Fraserborough in the, uh, in the northeast, uh, Fraserborough in recovery, who received a thousand pounds of grant funding and offers peers mentoring, alternative therapies and showcases recovery journeys. The road to recovery is the only way to approach to tackle the problem of drug use. And yet, I am delighted that the expert group recognized that it can only be delivered as part of a coherent person-centered recovery plan. While drug taking in the general population is falling, drug death statistics show an aging cohort of drug users. Drug deaths in under 25s are falling and are the lowest since records began. Many of those lost to us are older drug users who after years have become, have become increasingly unwell. Drug death statistics reflect wider sources of data that show a decrease in drug use among the general population and that far fewer young people are using drugs than ever before. My generation has a huge responsibility for the number of people affected by the problem of drug use. Presenting officer, too many people of my age are still choosing to ignore the danger of drug use despite the numbers of friends and family we lost to drug use over the years. <laughs> I can see that younger generations with the education program put in place for Scottish school children have a different attitude to drug use. I know that my daughters have, I, know, I hope that my grandchildren will have the same kind of attitude. This is borne out in the statistics which show that drug taking among young people is the lowest in a decade. This is encouraging. And in closing, I would like to thank everyone involved in delivering the Scottish Government strategy. 
This strategy is keeping people alive. I know how important it is for families across Scotland of different backgrounds. Uh, opioid replacement therapy, methadone, is keeping a member of my family alive, and I'm thankful for this. Thank you very much. I now call Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Graham Pearson. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and can I uh, thank Christian Allard for uh, that very thoughtful uh, and uh, heartfelt contribution. I think the, benef uh, the debate very much benefits by that uh, type of uh, contribution. This is a, a debate I, I very much welcome. It of course, follows uh, the debate we uh, had uh, last year. It is an important issue. Uh, those uh, constituents who will be uh, uh, living uh, with a, a dependency... Mr Hepburn, I'm having some difficulty hearing you. Would you be able to move the microphone round okay. slightly? Thank you very much. I'll try talking louder as well, President yeah. Officer. We'll see if that helps. People don't usually have a difficulty hearing me, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the point I was making, President Officer, is that few uh, of my constituents or any of our constituents in terms of uh, the numbers will uh, themselves have a, a dependency issue. And I'll maybe uh, use some of the statistics that are available for the NHS Lanarkshire area that covers my own constituency that set that out in some uh, detail. But for the individual uh, affected, though, there is a serious uh, impact on the uh, person with uh, that uh, uh, dependency. Uh, people who are often uh, suffering from complex multiple uh, problems, a point made by uh, Elaine Murray, uh, very vulnerable uh, people. Uh, there is, of course, an impact on uh, the person's family uh, as well, a point made by uh, Jim Eady, who amongst us would hope for their children to uh, have a drug addiction. Uh, and then, of course, there is the impact on others, on wider society, on our communities, because we know that uh, many people will uh, undertake criminal activity to feed uh, their habits. So it is absolutely right that we have uh, this debate, and can I welcome uh, the work of uh, the expert group and uh, their report. So, officer, it's been, I think, a, a historic week. Uh, uh, this is an important debate. It might not quite fulfil the function of uh, 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 the historic terms of some of the others that we've had this debate, but I do think it, it gives a lie to the suggestion that has been uh, posited by some in this chamber that uh, Scotland uh, is on pause, because I think this debate is a vivid uh, demonstration of uh, the Scottish Government uh, taking action uh, to get on with the business of, of government working to improve uh, support and treatment uh, of those with uh, a, a, an ad addiction. And I think they, they have, the government has a, a good uh, record in that uh, regard. Of course, they established and published the uh, National Drug Strategy, uh, the Road to Recovery, uh, in 2008. Uh, last November, we had uh, our uh, a debate, um, uh, and indeed that followed uh, the uh, publication uh, uh, the commissioning of the uh, independent group uh, whose report uh, we uh, uh, debate today. So I think that is uh, a significant effort towards uh, the end of uh, improving support for those with uh, an addiction. And uh, as I suggested I would earlier, I want to talk about the uh, situation in my own area. Uh, Mary Scanlon suggested she was concerned about the rate of progress. And I think in this uh, area we should always be concerned about the rate of progress. We want to do uh, everything we can. But I do think there is broadly a good uh, record in the NHS Lanarkshire uh, area, which of course covers uh, my Cumbernauld and Colsaith uh, constituency. Uh, uh, and this year, we've seen uh, the Scottish Government allocate nearly £6 million, uh, which is up from £4.3 million in 2008 uh, for drug and alcohol treatment. And that's made a real uh, contribution, I think, to begin to tackle uh, the problem of uh, drug taking in the NHS Lanarkshire area. Uh, because we have seen uh, that uh, drug taking across the general population is falling from 12.6% uh, in 2006 to 9.1% uh, in 2010 11 uh, of uh, 16 to 59 year olds self reporting drug use in the last year. Uh, and again, uh, amongst young people in particular, uh, uh, in 2010, uh, uh, it was the lowest in a decade. It dropped to 11% uh, from 23% of 15 year olds reporting drugs use in the last uh, month. And in terms of uh, treatment, uh, we see uh, in the Lanarkshire area uh, some 98.8 per cent of people are treated within three weeks, as opposed to for drugs and alcohol uh, uh, addiction, uh, as opposed to the Scottish wide uh, 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 figure of 96 per cent. And uh, no one is waiting more than six weeks for treatment in the NHS Lanarkshire area. Now, le unless it is, uh, I'm accused of uh, painting an entirely uh, rosy picture, let me uh, recognise that in uh, the Lanarkshire area uh, in the last 
four years, there uh, has been a, an increase in the number of drug-related uh, deaths. So I'm not saying everything is perfect. There is obviously uh, still more to be done, but I think the overall picture is one of, of progress, and that is to be uh, welcomed. Uh, and in that respect, uh, I very much welcome the report of the independent expert uh, group. It has to be seen as a contribution to uh, building on uh, progress and going uh, further. Uh, and I think Brian Kidd, who of course uh, chaired the group, uh, set that out when he uh, said that the review identified a range of areas in which progress is required. And looking at how people have responded to uh, that report, we see that uh, David Liddell, the director of Scottish Drugs Forum, has uh, welcomed uh, the expert group's report. And I think that's very important, given uh, the fact that they work with uh, people on the ground, those who are affected by uh, addiction, who campaigning for greater awareness uh, and greater change in this uh, area. They obviously support and back this uh, report. And Community Pharmacy Scotland uh, made a number of important points. And I thought Willie Rennie, Rennie made a very a good uh, contribution to uh, the debate. I thought his point about the work of pharmacists was uh, well made. They buy into this uh, report uh, as well. And given that they are, and they make this point in their briefing to us, that they are the health professionals who interact with uh, patients receiving uh, opiate replacement therapies the most, and they will be in uh, those areas that, uh, of uh, their uh, greatest deprivation. They're probably the healthcare professionals that people living in those areas will see uh, most often, and we are aware of the correlation, uh, not the hard and fast rule, but the correlation between uh, poverty and addiction, then they uh, uh, have an important role uh, to play in uh, rising to the uh, challenge well. So it's clear uh, that we are seeing uh, this report being welcomed. I very much welcome it, and I look forward to seeing uh, further work from the government in this regard. Thank you, Mr Hepburn, and apologies for interrupting your speech. We do seem to be having some slight problems with the sound levels, and I've, had, I've asked to have those checked. Some other members have indicated to me that they're having difficulty hearing, so it's not just me. And as you point out, we usually can hear you quite well. Thank you. Graham Pearson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think it's, it's right that we should remember that we've faced 35 years of challenge in relation to drugs misuse as it affects Scotland. And in that time, as has been alluded to by many members in the Chamber, much good work has been achieved by those employed by government and those in the third sector uh, in the various elements of work that they do, uh, combating the threat and the dangers and the health risks that uh, are presented by drug misuse. In that light, I welcome Dr Brian Kidd's report and I welcome the work that's been done by the team who assisted Dr Kidd in its presentation. And I think that Jim Eady, in, in his uh, contribution, identified quite properly that the strategic approach which underlies some of the lessons that uh, Dr Kidd outlines is one of the most important uh, messages. Wally, Ray mentioned that, uh, Wally Rennie mentioned that, that uh, he had visited some of the groups, and like him, uh, I also have visited many of the groups. Uh, I don't know I would fully agree with his assessment of how we arrived at the current situation, because I think it's fair to say that at the time this report was initiated, there was a growing clamour of criticism here in this chamber and I was one of those who offered those criticisms, and there was a campaign by the Daily Record. And it was on the back of that development that we saw this review taking place. And no matter what brought it to, to pass, eh, it's a most welcome review at this time. There was never, a, a, in my view, a, a presentation which suggested that there should be an end to opioid replacement therapies. I think that that was either a misunderstanding of the case or a misrepresentation of what was trying to be achieved here. The problem that we were trying to address, and what we now, I think, understand more clearly, is that the numbers of people who are accessing the treatment therapies, particularly through methadone, is somewhere in excess of 20,000 people in Scotland. The cost of the service being provided is estimated at around 36 million. £100,000 a day being delivered. But in that light, our numbers of drugs deaths have risen to a record high. And last year, 41% of those deaths involved methadone. 
United Nations Office of Drugs Control unfortunately places Scotland in the unenviable position of leading the league tables in opioid abuse. And that's not something that any of us would wish to be party to. There has been cross-party support for successive government and administration policies, and I think that's quite proper. But that support should not be without a commitment and without the ability for us to offer uh, observations and criticisms of, of where we sit. And it's important that the new review has focused very firmly on recovery oriented systems of care. And I welcome that impetus and focus of delivery for outcomes that would seek recovery. And recovery can mean many things to many different people. What I would hope that the Minister will be able to say at the end of our debate today is that there will be steps taken to deal with the lack of evidence presented by some ADPs regarding a real impetus towards recovery. In addition, that the real concerns around a lack of progress found in many ADP areas regarding the delivery of recovery-orientated systems of care will be dealt with and that he will monitor that, that outcome. The third point made in the report, a lack of institutional memory, leading to repeated uh, mistakes and, and false trails and failing to capitalise on success. And as was alluded to earlier, the improving of local information systems to better identify people on ORT so that we can know what works. At the end of the day, there won't be a member in this chamber and those who haven't attended today who don't want the government to succeed. We all want success in this area. But we need to measure what we're doing. We need to know what's being done in our name through the policy of a road to recovery. And we need to know that what is being done in our name is effective and is giving everyone who's involved in this treatment the opportunity to succeed in their terms. It has been alluded to that some will not recover and that they will require to be maintained uh, through methadone or some other method. We need to accept that. But we need also to have an ambition for every patient who enters into our care to give them a chance to be all they can be in their lives and in their future and to allow them to play a full part in their families, in their communities, and in the life that is Scotland's future. And it is in that context that we urge the ministers to take the lessons that lie within this review and apply them with some energy and come back to the chamber to tell us on a regular basis what has been achieved and what benefits we have from applying the pressures as suggested. I support the amendment, which is in the name of Elaine Murray, and thank you for the opportunity of speaking today. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by John Pentland. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm very glad that Graham Pearson has had the opportunity to uh, contribute to the debate. Um, when I was a member of the Justice uh, One Committee uh, that Pauline McNeill led, uh, I first met Graham Pearson uh, over dinner uh, in Glasgow to discuss drug problems. Uh, the dinner was excellent, but the message was compellingly disturbing. Uh, Graham, uh, I recall on that occasion, told us of a drug dealer in Glasgow who'd gone in with a handful of cash and bought a brand new Bentley out of a showroom. He told us that that same individual had uh, bought a fleet of cars for his uh, private hire taxi uh, company. He told us that this is a social problem uh, that we're discussing today, but also an economic problem, perhaps 1.5 to 5 per cent of our GDP. If you were just to look at it in economic terms, that's a loss of tax take of between half a billion and one and a half billion for Scotland alone. But the reality is that the finance is uh, relatively not the issue. Um, I first spoke uh, in the Parliament here on the 27th of October 2004 uh, in a drugs debate, and at that point I said addiction is a feature of human behaviour and realistically it cannot be eliminated. Uh, James VI, of course, in his uh, 
uh, counter blast to the evils of tobacco uh, 400 years ago uh, described smokers being by custom is peace and peace allured. The whole issue of addiction is very far from being a new one. Um, it's worth perhaps saying um, that uh, in the 1890s, Sears and Roebuck, a well-known American retailer, uh, actually had in the catalog they distributed to millions of homes across the United States, you could buy a syringe and cocaine for $1.50. So attitudes have changed and the impact of addiction has changed. But 100 years ago, it was recognized that this was a major issue. The first international drug control treaty was the International Opium Convention uh, of 1912. Uh, that was from a conference that was held in Shanghai. From the 1950s, of course, uh, for us, we started to see that the relatively small group of morphine addicts who were looked after by the GPs, and my father as a GP had a tiny handful uh, that he looked after. But even then, we could see the impact of criminality. There was in 1951 a single drug addict who broke into a dispensary in the outskirts of London. Um, some years later, a decade later, it was discovered from that single criminal act 60 addicts had been created who are now uh, suffering the problems. So it is all too easy for little acts to have huge consequences in this area. In the 1960s, of course, it was thought there were relatively few addicts. In fact, the Home Office in 1964 reported for the UK as a whole there were 753 addicts. I think at the time that was questioned and it was also questionable. But it certainly led with greater understanding to the Dangerous Drugs Act. Although at that time it was thought the problem was so limited in Scotland, there was actually no provision whatsoever uh, for Scotland. But by the late 70s, boy, did we know that we had a problem. Today, we've got uh, this excellent report before us. Uh, that is showing what we're doing to deal with that problem. And we certainly can't, just by simply reversing the actions that got us to this position, get to a position where we undo it. We've got to be proactive. Originally, we sought simply to support the addicts and their addiction would be dealt with medically. But now, of course, addiction has this huge reach into criminality. It also is a public health and infection issue uh, that has to be dealt with. Let's not forget, too, that this addiction, the opioid addiction that's the subject of today's debate, is, of course, part of a whole series of addictions we have in our society. Alcohol, gambling, nicotine. I even had a member of staff who worked for me, uh, among the hundreds who did, who was addicted to a proprietary nasal spray. He consumed 20 bottles a day, although it didn't seem to affect his life. And the illegal drugs that we are talking about today and the issues with which we have to deal in that context are in part related to the free cigarettes that were dispensed to servicemen during the Second World War, desensitizing us to the idea of addiction being something uh, that should be avoided. It's worth, uh, perhaps in closing, presiding officer, welcoming very much the consensual nature of this debate, bringing different points of view and different experience and different inputs, yes, but all pointing in the same direction. And I think uh, Willie Rennie made reference to that. Two examples of how you can mishandle it are perhaps worth uh, going back to. Derek Hatton, who is the deputy Labour leader of Liverpool uh, City Council, wanted to attack Margaret Thatcher. Now, I might be up for that, but he did so by designating Liverpool as smack city. We're still living on the back of that. And in my constituency, the actions of our now deceased GP, Sandy Wisely, who talked up a drug problem in Fraserburgh, quite unnecessarily and unjustifiably, are something we still with, deal with today in reputational terms. We've had a good balanced debate. Let's hope that continues. And I very much support the essence of what's said in the Labour amendment, but very much the government's uh, motion. Presiding officer. Thank you. And I now call John Pentland to be followed by Gil Patterson. 
presiding officer, methadone maintenance treatment is not a solution to drug addiction. It replaces one form of addiction with another. It can, however, enable an addict to stabilise their addiction and begin to rebuild their lives. As well as making their addiction more manageable, methadone treatment is safer than taking drugs of unknown origin and strength, which may involve sharing syringes and needles, with the risk of contracting hepatitis and HIV. Methadone treatment is sometimes criticised by the media or members of the public who think that more should be done to cure addiction through abstinence. An alternative that I, I, that, that I understand is used in some countries, such as Russia, as Wally Rennie has already mentioned. But for many users, withdrawal is easier said than done, as there may be adverse physiological and psychological consequences. That is the nature of addiction. And for that reason, opioid re replacement therapies have long been central to harm reduction measures. And that role was endorsed five years ago by the Road to Recovery Strategy. However, despite this apparent consensus, the evidence is not clear cut. The expert review recognises there are issues with the evidence that is available and quotes the 2012 UK Drug Policy Commission. Drug policy is currently a mix of cautious politics and limited evidence and analysis. And this is coupled with strident and contested inter inter interpretations, both of the causes of the problems and the effects of policies. In fact, for as long as there, there has been a drug policy, there have been gaps in the evidence, as well as the uncertainty about how to understand and to act on the evidence that we do have. So it's in this context that I am pleased that the review not only dealt with many people involved in delivering and receiving a variety of treatments, but also accorded their views and experiences equal status with local and national bodies. Now, if we are to develop an effective person-centred approach to opioid addiction, it is essential that such evidence is a significant part of our consideration for the best way forward. And one aspect made clear by such stakeholder input is that some alcohol and drug partnerships perform poorly when it comes to recovery. The report notes that there was little evidence presented by the ADP, ADPs regarding a real impetus towards recovery, and stakeholder reports supported this view. The review highlights the, that basic information was not often accessible. Clear strategic plans and objective reports of improvement were rare. Elements of recovery, orientated services were often absent. And the review criticises the organisational structure of the ADPs. There was not a strong sense of accountability and systems are destined to, be, to continue repeating mistakes or failing to capitalise on successes. These add up to quite a damning indictment. Addicts who are motivated to stop are unlikely to succeed without the right help and support, not only for the initial period of withdrawal, but also in the longer term. And that help needs to address the circumstances that contribute to drug addiction and the relationship between drug taking and criminal behaviour. And I welcome the review's consideration of these issues and its findings which seek a more consistent approach that focuses on recovery as a primary aim. The review recommends that a full range of care services should be available in every area, including community rehabilitation services such as detox, residential rehabilitation, and services dealing with employability and housing. And it also recommends development of better ways to link action on health inequalities with action to address proper 
problem substance misuse. And one key measure would be to make sure local inequality strategies refer to plans to address the risks associated with substance misuse. And with regard to drug-related crime, drug treatment and testing orders have an important role to play, and we need to use them better as part of a joined-up system that supports addicts to overcome their addiction. Now, while this debate is focused on opioids, we should also bear in mind that many addicts have multiple addictions. The system needs to take account of patterns of drug use that encompasses combinations of alcohol, opiates and other substances. And finally, I note the recommendations on the pharmacy services. The role of the pharmacies have involved. It has become an important role, but given how it, it has changed, we do not need to look at its operation to ensure that it's working best effect as part of the overall strategy. So I support the recommendation that there should be a national specification to ensure consistent high quality care across the country and that the system used to reimburse pharmacists for dispensing methadone should be reviewed. You must conclude. We have heard how many deaths result from substance misuse Presiding officer, any death is one death too many, and we need to make sure that we have a system that provides appropriate treatment options for everyone who wants to escape the dangers of addiction. Thank you. I call Gil Patterson to be followed by John Finney. Uh, presiding officer, I am very pleased to be speaking in this debate. And al although this is primarily a, a justice debate, I would like to take a little of my time to raise the issues of health inequalities, uh, touching on what I have learned during my time in the Health and Sports Committee, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment or two. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, when debating the impact of drug use, uh, we must acknowledge in the devastating impact it has on local communities, on families, and on the individuals themselves. This is just as important when debating how best to treat those who have a history of drug abuse and who are trying to get clean. Due to their past problems, some have lost friends, became lepers in their own community, and are shunned by family members. And yet, these groups of people are the very resource that is needed to ensure that those who seek treatment are given the encouragement to continue with the treatment and the support when challenges emerge, and they surely will. It is in these times that local agencies must come to the fore to offer their support. Without these, uh, without there is a, a danger of a person not completing uh, his or her treatment and f falling back into drug misuse. Within my own constituency, there is an organisation that offers support to those who suffer from drug abuse called Alternatives. Since February 2000, they have been working in, Clyde, in the Claybank area to offer alternatives to drugs, a drug use through a range of services to individuals and families currently or previously affected by drugs. This organisation carries out a great deal of work and is proactive in their attempts to bring people out of drug abuse. Their outreach programme is an umbrella, an umbrella term for a style of work literally meaning reaching uh, to where people are at. Alternatives do not wait for people to seek help once they see themselves as having a drug or health problem, but seeks them out with the aim of providing education and services di directly in the community. Although this motion acknowledges that opiate replacement therapies have a strong evidence base it is important to look at other avenues at which to treat those who suffer from drug misuse. The Alternatives Group is one such avenue, and I would com commend them on the hard work and its members and, volunteer and volunteers carry out in the local community. More importantly, the impact of their work on individuals and families should be encouraged by all. In a number of debates in this parliament, 
that has focused on health issues, which I have, I have contributed to, the main theme has been to move to a service of treatment and recovery that is person-centred. This debate is no different, and I am pleased that the Scottish Government has accepted the expert group's conclusions and they, they are committed to delivering the recommendations as part of a coherent person-centred recovery plan. All services may be local or national, but be focused on the individual's needs. And I support the calls for, a, for better information systems to identify people who are opioid replacement treatment, A4 a, a, opioid replacement treatments, and ensure that they are making progress with their recovery. There is a very little point of offering this treatment if it's not part of a plan with smart goals. Goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, realist and timious to ensure, ensure progress in treatment and recovery. These must be constantly monitored to ensure that recovery is taking place to a satisfactory level. But when looking at different systems that are, that are in place or should be strengthened or established, it is difficult to do so with the level of inequality that exists. Some people argue that it is inequality in access to health that contributes to and is the main cause of drug abuse. I feel that this is missing the bigger picture. Health inequality, social inequality, and inequality across the boards can be summed up in one word, poverty. It would come as no surprise to everyone that those who live in poorer areas are more likely to suffer from the effects of drug abuse, may it be personal or within their family. Regardless of how much money is thrown at health inequality, it can be a waste if we don't bring people out of poverty. If someone grows up in a family or in an area where they are written off or have been told time and time again that they are useless, worthless, it will make no difference, eh, eh, almost no difference to them if resources are ploughed into that area. There are people in bad circumstances who because of the stigma of poverty and the perpetual message of hopelessness, they adopt an, a, fatalistic, a fatalistic attitude that for them amounts to, this is as good as it gets for people like me. This is my lot. Therefore, to tackle the cause, we need to break the cycle of poverty. By making people's lives meaningful with well-paid employment, giving them confidence to believe in a better life, if we do that, then I can promise that health inequalities will narrow as people are lifted out of poverty. You must conclude. The Scottish Government has got that message well and truly. This Parliament needs the full powers to change the lives of people and make the difference to, to both inequalities and misuse of drugs. I commend this motion to Parliament. Thank you. We're now running rather short of time. I must ask the next three speakers to keep to their six minutes, please. John Finney to be followed by Dennis Roberts. Thank you, President Officer. I, I too welcome the broad consensus that we've heard, uh, um, and hopefully that will continue. I want to comment on, on the, some research. Uh, the life stories of 55 people, not statistics, but people, and I was delighted to hear the Minister talk about a human rights-based approach that's going to be taken. Um, and the main aim of that research was to record and understand the life stories of problem drug users. And we've heard many examples of what came out from that. I think it was compelling that the interviewers were SDF, Scottish Drug Forum uh, volunteers in recovery. And I commend uh, that approach, the approach that was also used in relation to the Naloxone Peer Educator Initiative. Delighted too that it covered urban and rural Scotland um, because uh, this is not a, a problem that's limited to uh, the central belt is a problem that covers the entire nation, unfortunately. Again, it comes as no surprise to anyone that most problem drug users were from disadvantaged neighbourhoods and were personally disadvantaged. And there's no doubt in my mind that anti-poverty policies and the promotion of equalities in terms of income disparity uh, have the potential to make significant impact. 
Um, also, a, an association between uh, problem drug use and deprivation uh, um, is worsened um, by stigmatisation, and we've heard that. And I find that particularly galling when that can often come from people who systematically abuse alcohol, um, almost a, a strange snobbery associated with that. Many of these people talked about um, significant childhood problems, anxiety, attention deficit, hyperactivity and con conduct disorders. And uh, hopefully that's something that the GERFEC approach will pick up on, catch. I think Anne McTaggart's comments about uh, education are very important. And I certainly commend the patient's journey approach, which looks at the opportunity where interventions could have made a difference uh, taking that uh, approach. Um, Use, uh, we also heard in the, the research that using alcohol and drugs relatively heavily from a relatively young age was usually in the context of socialising and having fun. In a previous debate, I mentioned to the, the health minister the cynical targeting by the social media that's taking place. That's a significant problem, and the promotion, whether that's through uh, peer promotion or globally as is happening there, is something that we need to uh, address, I certainly believe. Um, we uh, also hear of the uh, multi-agency approach to everything, and that's, that's fine, but there clearly are challenges for local authorities, for housing associations, where the competing issues of providing housing and the disruption that sometimes can come um, with um, people with uh, drug addiction issues, and we need to certainly get around that. We also need to get around the situation of GPs refusing access to people because of their addiction. Um, Many, many addicts, of course, are not bothered. They're not concerned about the implications. They will experiment with the so-called legal highs because they have, they feel nothing to live for. Uh, and we also have to remember that many of them are, are uh, victims of violence because violence associates itself with the, the street drugs trade. An area that concerned me particularly was uh, estrangement from families, difficulties within care and custody of our access to children. And I think we should work very strongly to keep family units together. Um, certainly social work departments will have a very child-centred approach to that, and that's quite rightly the case. I too support method, and it's an important part of the process. It was regarded as an essential aid on the road to recovery, offering the possibility of improvement, increased stability, and significantly for me, the reduced need for street drugs. Um, I thought it was interesting that in that research, we also heard that there was difficulties getting and keeping methadone prescription. And I have to say, uh, my intervention to the Minister was ab about the patchwork of services, and I don't think we should have any no-go areas for provision of services, and I include Argyll in my own area, where ignorance has been prevailing thus far, but I think NHS Highland are going to ensure that the full range of services that should be available to all citizens will be available. I'd like to raise an issue with the Minister that uh, my colleague Patrick Harvey has previously raised, and that is, relates to diamorphine, which we know is a, a controlled drug. Um, and it can be prescribed um, to a patient for the treatment of drug misuse and addiction. And in the written reply that Mr Harvey received, uh, the minister said that such decisions should be based on individual patient need and are a matter of clinical judgment for the patient's doctor. It, it, certainly the understanding is that no licence requests have been made, and that may be connected with a, an understanding that this would be a departure from government policy. Well, I want to see no areas uh, ruled out uh, for uh, assisting people uh, with drug issues, and that includes uh, the prescribing of heroin on a harm reduction basis, which clearly would require to be assessed. So I'd welcome either of the Minister's comments on that. That also goes for the very challenging aspect of supervised injection. That clearly has a role in harm reduction as well, and street drug analysis. Um, Final now, minute. Thank you. Um, there's no doubt that our... Um, harm reduction people are, are dealing often with very challenging individuals um, with disruptive uh, lifestyles and anything that can be do uh, can be done to to help um, is uh, to my mind worth trying so i would ask for consideration of these initiatives please i thought the phrase that uh, i found very compelling was maximizing what people can recover to because people must have something to aspire to and i think with some compassion understanding and care we can make things better for them thank you Many thanks. I now call Dennis Robertson to be followed by Mark Macdonald. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Yes, it has been a very positive and I think very consensual debate. Um, we have used the term, and I think most members have, have referred to it at some point uh, during their speech, the person-centred approach. 
presenting officer, this is not new, and I'm sure I, McTaggart, uh, will testify to the fact that being in social work, this has been a, 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 an approach for many years. And indeed, the minister, uh, from his previous uh, life in the health service and occupational therapy, we're very much aware of this person-centred approach. It just seems to me that we're, we're using it as to say, you know, this is maybe the, 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 the magic pathway or whatever. It isn't. Um, because we need to be absolutely sure when we're talking person-centred, we're being inclusive. The person generally doesn't live their life in isolation. They live their life in a community, if not in a family. And if we don't involve the family or that community, then maybe perhaps like uh, Gil Patterson was referring to, where is their sense of worth? Because before we actually move on to the road of recovery, a person has to, to try and identify where they're at and where they perhaps would like to be. And sometimes that requires someone, a professional, giving that appropriate guidance, giving them that sense that they're being listened to, giving them that sense that it, they are very much important. The only issue I perhaps would take just with uh, Gil Patterson's uh, comments in terms of uh, the poverty and uh, drugs and, and poverty and the uh, inequality in terms of health uh, does create problems. But can I say to the Chamber, I've seen it in the affluent areas of the North East. I've seen drug addiction happen where money is absolutely no object. I've seen it in affecting families who, to some extent, are not aware that it's happening because it hasn't impacted on that family life. It hasn't impacted on the family bills. The mortgage is still getting paid. The other bills are getting paid, but yet the abuse, the misuse is still there. Presiding officer, I think we have moved on a great deal in the area of stigma towards people and drug addiction. And I think one of the areas that we've moved on, I think perhaps greater than maybe people give credit for, is in the community pharmacy service. Because I believe with the embracing of that service within the community, and, and I, I commend the work that the community pharmacists are doing uh, within the whole of Scotland. And in my own uh, area of uh, Grampian, there's 131 community pharmacy practices, and I believe it's 127 are engaged. You know, and, and that is to be commended. But the community pharmacy can see the whole picture, the bigger picture, because they see the individual perhaps coming in and perhaps getting the prescription for methadone. But they can also see the wife or the brother or the father or the mother coming into that same practice, perhaps getting their prescription, perhaps a prescription that is helping them deal and cope with the addiction of either the, uh, one of their loved ones. Presiding officer, we have a long way to go, but we have made significant progress. Can I congratulate my friend and colleague, Christian Allard, for, for bringing to this debate a very personal, and sharing a very personal story. And many of us can actually look at our personal circumstances and reflect that where we are and where our families are. I too, in the social work area I used to work in, came across many examples of despair, distraught, and absolute tragedy. The parent asking, why? Why did my daughter die? Why did it happen? What did I do wrong? And the guilt that they carry for the rest of their lives, believing that they should have done something. But in reality, presiding officer, they probably did all they could. It is when, it is when we turn our back on people requiring our help that we should feel guilty. It's when we turn our back on our communities and our society because we don't approve that we should feel guilty. I believe in this chamber we have the consensus to move things forward. And I appreciate what Mary Scanlon said. Perhaps it's not moving quickly enough, but I think it's moving at a pace that we can evaluate, that the evidence is there. 
because we need that evidence base to move forward at uh, probably in a way which we can prevent perhaps maybe deaths in the future. We will never get to the bottom of this. Stuart Stevenson, as always, brought his, his history back to the chamber. Addiction has been with us for centuries. It will probably remain with us for centuries. You should be but on a positive it, note, presiding officer, we have consensus and we have a pathway, I believe, to success. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Mark Macdonald. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, this is an important debate, uh, and like Willie Rennie, I, I too have noted the change of tone since last year's debate. I think it is a welcome change. I think it is always better when we work consensually on sensitive issues such as this, uh, rather than see individuals or parties making a cheap bid for the headlines, which can often derail the, the, the progress that is being made. And I think it is welcome that that, that has not been prevalent in, in today's debate. Dennis Robertson makes an important point in his speech uh, around the fact that wh while I absolutely take on board the points that have been raised about the individual circumstances and how those at the sharp end of poverty and disadvantage often find themselves at the sharp end of drug misuse, that absolutely is correlated by figures. But also in the North East, which Dennis and I represent, we have a particular problem around affluent drug use. And these are people who probably don't classify themselves or wouldn't consider themselves to be problem drug users. They probably would consider themselves to be recreational drug users. But what we also have to accept and, and remember is that there are circumstances beyond an individual's income. You know, uh, factors affecting an individual, such as, for example, abuse of sexual or domestic nature, don't confine themselves to those in the lowest income brackets. And we must remember that as well, that it is not solely by an individual's income that we should define them in terms of how uh, drug misuse can affect them. And I thought Christian Allard brought to the Chamber an extremely powerful uh, personal testimony. And in last year's debate, I, I made the point that if I was to take my school yearbook in, I could point to individuals, individuals who, to all intents and purposes, could have been said to have the same life chances that I had, but who had fallen into addiction. And again, that goes to the heart of, we don't know what may have gone on or been going on in the private lives of those individuals, which may have affected the way that their lives went and the trajectory that their lives took. But there is much, I think, to be welcomed, and, and others have commented on treatment statistics. And in Aberdeen City, uh, I note that uh, in, dr in terms of drugs and alcohol, 99.5% uh, are being treated within three weeks, and nobody in Aberdeen City is waiting more than six weeks for treatment. I think that is an extremely welcome statistic. Obviously, we want to move it to the point at which it is 100% for three weeks, but I think to have 100% being treated within six weeks, I think is uh, nonetheless extremely positive. I know also in terms of uh, drug deaths, while absolutely drug deaths are probably a lot higher than we would wish to see them, um, we, it's worth noting that drug deaths in the under 25 age bracket are at the lowest level since records began. And indeed, in the city of Aberdeen, um, drug deaths have reduced from 31 in 2010 to 16 in 2012. I think that, again, is welcome progress. And in terms of the, the drug taking, uh, I note drug taking in the general population is falling 12.9% uh, in 2008 to 9.1% in 2010 11 among 16 to 59 year olds who self report their drug use. Uh, and amongst young people, it's uh, at the lowest in a decade, 23% in 2002 to 11% in 2010 at the statistics uh, published by ISD in December 2011. And around, there are around 3,200 drug users within the city of Aberdeen, and Aberdeen, uh, Aberdeen Drugs Action uh, tell me that around 2,000 of these uh, drug users uh, are currently accessing drug treatment. Obviously, that then means there are 1,200 out there who we need to reach uh, and try and encourage them to also seek treatment. I would imagine some of them will fall into the category that I had uh, mentioned earlier. 
The Aberdeen Drugs Action offers a range of services across the city, from a counselling service uh, available to drug users, ex-users and also family members. And I think we've made the point that involving the family in an individual's treatment is vital because they have a role to play as well in terms of assisting the recovery of that individual. But they also have specialist counselling available for people affected by HIV or hepatitis B and C, for female drug users, for young people, parents or relatives of drug users and also for people who are drug free but who may find themselves affected by drug misuse uh, through extended family or friends. Uh, they offer city outreach services as well. Uh, they have a weekly drop in advice, information and needle exchange sessions in my constituency at Maastricht, Northfield, Woodside and Middlefield. And the Woodside Outreach Service uh, is a dedicated worker for the Woodside area operating two days per week at Printfield Community Project and Woodside Fountain Centre. Uh, the Outreach Drugs Worker offers individual counselling support, advice and training to drug users, families, community groups and professionals in the Woodside area. It's about a whole community approach to recovery and I think that is important. Final and there's also the Aberdeen Recovery Community, a partnership between Drugs Action and Aberdeen Foyer, which seeks not just to ensure that individuals recover, but also identify skills, interests, tries to ensure that when the individual has been treated, they have the opportunity to reintegrate into society through employment and opportunities that are brought from that. Because I believe if a system uh, receives an individual uh, for, from drug use but does not deal with the other factors affecting that individual, then it can be said that the addiction has been treated but the person has not. And I think what we need to get to is the stage where it is the person that is being treated and the factors that affect that person. I think that's the concept of wraparound treatment that the government is emphasising. So I welcome the report, I welcome the progress that is being made and I welcome the very much welcome the consensus that has arisen during the course of the debate. And if that consensus can hold, uh, I think we can continue to make extremely positive progress in this area. Many thanks. That then brings us to the closing speeches and I call on Jackson Carlaw. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to start with the contribution from Christine Allard, who I thought made a very arresting contribution to the debate. Um, and he referred several times in there, as well as his experience of France, which of course I would regard as a model for nothing at all, but uh, he referred several times in his contribution to his generation. And actually, I don't know what age Christian Allard does, but the concept of generation struck me. Because I've got to say, growing up in the 1960s, drug taking was presented as a highly glamorous thing. It was the food of film stars of Hollywood, of fashion, of the racy society in London, of smart parties. Uh, if people died of drug addiction, it wasn't of an overdose, it was they'd had an attack of the vapours, or they were of a fragile constitution. There was nothing bleak really portrayed in that language. And as we went through later into the 60s, it was the way people escaped the realities of Vietnam. LSD was the creative food of what was underpinning the pop movement of the time. Uh, and yet, in her opening speech, I thought Rosanna Cunningham, in a completely unadorned and factual way, got us right back to the fact that in the second decade of the 21st century, the reality is we had the highest number of deaths in Scotland through drugs. And these were not people at smart society parties or film stars or people who were being part of the creative process. In many cases, some through too much money, but in all too many cases, as has been said through the course of the debate, through circumstances, poverty, inequality have been led into uh, that situation. And I thought that the important point which underpinned the reason that we are considering the report and the recommendations within it, that for the first time a majority of those deaths uh, were as a result of methadone and that a majority of those on methadone who died were not on a methadone prescription uh, led to, I think, the need for the recommendations which we've been considering. And there was another distressing fact, uh, and that was that even within that, um, in Lothian, as opposed to Glasgow and Clyde, similar demographic areas, uh, the rate was twice as high in Lothian as it is in Glasgow and Clyde. So there, there are all sorts of underpinning trends in there that require to be addressed. And I think that is why it is important that in, this, in the way that community pharmacies dispense methadone, there has to be a real quality and a standard in terms of the service that is delivered, because those who have been dying of methadone not on a prescription have sourced that from somewhere, 
and it unfortunately probably has come from those who were being prescribed methadone. And so that standard is very important. And I don't take anything away from the tribute that Dennis um, Robertson paid to the commitment of community pharmacies. I've visited community pharmacies as well, and I have seen that, and I understand that it is very real. But underpinning many of these recommendations, I think it's not just a legislative will, and I think that the reason Rosanna Cunningham could be so unadorned and frank is because there is an appreciation in this chamber that this is a subject that has to be approached on a cross-party consensual basis and that there is no mileage to be gained in exploiting bad news where bad news exists and requires to be dealt with. That underpinning many of these recommendations is not some legislation, but a tremendous effort and commitment by human capital going forward in what is not a glamorous task. And I think that represents a huge challenge and one that we have to appreciate. Sandra White introduced the issue of prisons. And, you know, information that came to me, which I found depressing, uh, in relating to one prison, Sauton, where some 400 of the 800 uh, inmates are on methadone. They rarely detoxify. There are only two full-time addiction nurses with a caseload of 200 people each, compared to, say, one of 30 to 50 in the wider community. That is a depressing fact and, you know, is another example of the huge challenge that, that we have got to tackle. I'm on a lighter note, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, you said you were unable to hear Jamie Hepburn and I was going to offer to swap seats with you. Um, <laughs> Mr Hepburn, of course, makes a profession of gently admonishing me in debate, so if I can return the compliment by saying that today his was a model, if not a triumph, of improvisation. Um, we, we, heard from, we heard from Willie Rennie, um, who told us about Phoenix Futures and how everybody was hugging each other as he came through the door. I, as a father with children, I'd do much the same at the sight of a Liberal Democrat, and <laughs> particularly on Scotland Tonight, can I just say it. And from Stuart Stevenson, of course, we heard about his personal experience in the reign of King James VI. But I thought when we came back to uh, Jim Eadie, uh, and I think this was a point that came out from various other members, was about the stigma attached and the need to tackle all of that. I pay tribute to the work of the Scottish Drugs Forum and to, uh, the, um, to the Addiction Worker Training Project that I know the, the Minister has visited because our photo is on the wall with many of those there. And without exciting the temper of the debate, can I say that one of the things that would most help women to recover would be greater childcare, and I hope we can resist to make the obvious point in the context of this week in regard to that. Um, what they want to see is, as Anne McTaggart, I think, focused on, the, the trauma that affects families, the circumstances that led to that, a greater understanding and appreciation of that and projection of that into recovery, which, as Willie Rennie, I think, said, is an improving situation if we define it. I thought that both Elaine Murray and Graham Pearson uh, argued the amendment that the Labour Party have made in terms which I felt were constructive and we will be happy to support that. But fundamentally, the Minister should know that she has the support of this party in the work that she and her colleague are doing. Many thanks. And I now call on Rhoda Grant. You have eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and we welcome the review and its findings, um, which we hope will give a more consistent, uh, consistent and rounded approach, um, with recovery being at the main aim of that approach. Uh, we want to see clear commitment also from the Scottish Government to improving the routes to recovery from drug addiction, and that's why we're asking the Scottish Government to come forward uh, with a timetable for action. Many speakers today stated what I think is almost obvious, that the, this must be person-centred. Elaine Murray, John Pentland and many others said this. Um, this the, everyone's recovery is different because everyone's addiction is different and the causes for every, everyone's addiction is different. So if we don't have the person-centred um, person treatment available, then it just simply won't work. People don't fit into boxes. Um, they need to be at the centre of that, directing it. And indeed, I think it was Mary Scanlon that made the point that when we're looking at uh, bringing forward a strategy, we need to listen to drug users and indeed those who have recovered from drug use, because they are the experts in this. Um, and I think um, to, to sum up that concept, I think Graham Pearson put it right, we need to be ambitious for people. 
um, do the best for them, allow them to enjoy their lives and their lives with their families. I think that has to be the aim of our approach to this and realise we're dealing with human beings who have issues and we need to help them with those issues. Um, Families are also very much part of this, and I think, like everybody else, uh, Christian Allard's um, speech talking about the impact on family and friends of drug addiction was, was very moving and I think um, very helpful to this debate as well. I recently met Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs and they were really pressing home that point because sometimes they know what the causes are um, and they're actually best placed to help with the recovery. And if you um, give them the tools they need, give them the information they need, make them part of that, allow them to fulfil that role, they are much better able to intervene when the time is right and help people towards recovery. Um, and I think that was a point also made by Gil Patterson in the debate, a number of people talked about the age profile of, of people who have been addicted to heroin. And this also means that their families, especially their parents, which are often the people looking after them, are aging. You find people that are maybe becoming very disabled themselves due to old age, actually still looking out um, for, for their children. There's also an issue uh, surrounding young carers, and I think we have to deal with this um, you know, very clearly because I think there's a real fear from young carers about accessing the support that's available to them because they need um, the support due to the addiction of a parent and there's the fear of being taken into care as well. And we need to look at a child-centred approach to this. And I, I remember um, walking into a chemist one day and seeing a, a young lad, he was probably about 10, um, and as he saw me coming, I, it wasn't embarrassment on his face, it was absolute shame on his face as he stood beside his mother who was being handed her methadone by the pharmacist. And he was, he was dreading my coming up and being part of that. And it really brought home to me the impact that stigma has because that young lad was very aware of the stigma, was, was aware of what he thought my, my reaction was going to be. And I just felt as a society, we were really letting him down because he obviously didn't have the support, but he was living with the stigma every day. And I think a lot of people talked about the stigma, Jim Media among others. Um, the UK Drug Policy Commission actually um, had a report into this where, where a number of members have talked about, um, th talking about the feelings of shame and worthlessness um, engendered through stigma stigmatisation. And that has an impact on somebody's self-worth and you can never actually help somebody through this unless you build their self-worth. Um, and you know, families also describe that they're too afraid to reach out for help because they're too ashamed to speak to anybody about what's happening. If we don't deal with the stigma of this, we really hamper um, recovery and we actually stop people seeking help and therefore um, their, their journey to, towards recovery. Um, we also need, and I think our amendment makes it clear, to not only tackle um, the causes, help people towards recovery, but, but also tackle the causes um, of addiction. And I think a lot of people talked about this today. Gil Patterson talked about inequality, and I think he was right. But all, there are also the deeper causes, uh, trauma, mental health, as Mary Scanlon mentioned. None of those are income related, but they are also causes uh, for addiction. So we need to look at all of those in the round and tackle them. And we need to also tackle those for people who, who are, are suffering from addiction, because I think it was Willie Rennie said that actually the fear of recovery was so great, because once you stopped using the drugs, once you had the drugs to help you deal with the problems that actually caused that addiction, you had to go back and deal with those problems that were unsurmountable before and continue to be unless people get the real help they need uh, to deal with those issues. The, the, the debate is really about opioid replacements and I think they have their place and I think that everyone has agreed that. We need to make sure of course that the prescription is right. Um, I represent many rural remote areas where it's maybe not possible for people to attend a pharmacy or maybe get access and we need to look at different drug treatments for that, especially people who may be taking prescriptions home with them 
who share a home or children have access to that home, because it's very difficult, especially with methadone um, causing respiratory depre depression. If a child gets a hold of that by accident, and that can happen, children get everywhere, um, that can have a real impact on them. So maybe looking at prescribing, making sure that's not just the person who needs the prescription that has been thought of in that prescribing, it has to be also be the people that live with them. Um, and we need, as many people have said, to look at this as harm reduction, to help stabilise, um, but also put in the help and support too, because it's about dealing with the whole person and um, the causes um, that, that they, the causes of their addiction and how we can help them to come to terms with that. Many people spoke about the area drug partnerships, and I think... Um, we are right in that this needs to be tackled and monitored and I think it was Graham Pearson that made that point that the government needs to monitor the improvement in area drug partnerships because it's not fair that people don't have an equality of service. People need to have their issues dealt with. There has to be national standards and yes, local strategies, but those have to be the same for everybody. You should not be involved in a postcode lottery where your addiction is dealt with differently and indeed your recovery is less because of where um, you, you are um, geographically. If we, many people mentioned pharmacies, and I think we need to have a joined up approach between social work, health, pharmacies and the like, everyone who is dealing with that. And I think, going back to my point about the young lad, there has to be a dignity in the provision of that, because that, you, you know, there was no privacy there for him or his mother, and um, that impacted their reaction to, stig to, to stigmatisation. Presiding officer, I see that you're telling me to wind up. There's many other um, issues I could talk, on, talk about, and I could go on for ages, but I won't. Um, and we hope to see a timetable for the improvements outlined in the review, and I hope this will give people real hope for their, their future. Thank you, uh, Rhoda Grant. Uh, I now call Michael Matheson to wind up the debate. Minister, you have till five. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, uh, this has, as uh, some members have already stated, uh, been a largely consensual debate. And uh, over the years I've had in this Parliament, uh, debates around uh, drugs policy have largely been consensual debates, although the one last year wasn't uh, quite so consensual. But it's uh, uh, good that we've been able to have much more of a consensus this uh, time. And there's been a number of individuals who I recognise who have been engaged in the whole drugs debate in this Parliament over the last 14 years. There are a, a few uh, notable individuals who have not been able to participate in this debate or are not here. Uh, one uh, individual uh, uh, that uh, is no longer with us is Brian Adam, who would often participate in uh, drugs debates in this parliament. Richard Simpson is another, um, who obviously is un, uh, unwell. And um, uh, Annabel Goldie, uh, over the years, although I suspect Annabel Goldie's uh, prepping for a visit to my constituency this evening. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so there's a number of individuals who I, I recognise over the time would have uh, participated in our debate. I think it's also been a helpful debate in uh, putting the whole uh, drugs policy issue in that wider context about inequality in our society. And I thought Jackson Carlaw, showing his age a little, was able to reflect <laughs> on how over the last generation almost there has been a, and I do say generation almost, there has been a change in the way in which uh, 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 individuals have entered into uh, drug use uh, overall and uh, some of the personal experiences that we've heard from individuals in the course of the debate have uh, demonstrated that, in particular from Christian Allard and also uh, Mark MacDonald made reference to it as well and I know from my own personal experience a number of uh, uh, good friends who I've lost over the years, uh, either through directly through drug use, uh, associated with illness due to drug use, or through violence associated with drug use, all of whom uh, sadly are no longer uh, with us, some of whom were my uh, best friends at school. Uh, so there are, uh, you know, there are many in the chamber who have been touched by the, uh, the damage that uh, drugs misuse can uh, cause. I think the uh, report in itself, though, I think helpfully underlines that the road to recovery approach which we published five years ago is the right approach. It confirms that we are moving in the right direction uh, and it also highlights some areas where we have challenges and where we need to take further action in order to address some of the issues that have been highlighted in the report. I want to pick up on a couple of issues though because members have obviously made reference to ADPs, uh, 
uh, alcohol and drug partnerships and also the health aspect, and in particular some of the inconsistencies that can exist uh, between the 30 ADPs that we have in the country and also the way in which different health boards uh, deal with these matters. And, uh, both myself and uh, Rosanna Curring were determined to try and do as much as we can to get a level of consistency uh, uh, where possible. However, there is only so much you can do because it is worth keeping in mind uh, that alcohol drug partnerships are that. They are partnerships. They are partnerships between local authorities and health boards and others in order to try and reflect what is needed within that local community most effectively. Uh, and therefore, a top-down approach to prescribing everything they must do on the ground is not necessarily the best approach in order to allow that level of flexibility. Although, as my, I, I just finish this point, although as my, as my colleague Rosanna Curran highlighted, there is a range of priorities uh, that ministers set that they expect them to report on an annual basis, from the heat standard through to uh, the Scottish Drugs Misuse Database, uh, quality data uh, in the National Drug and Alcohol Treatment Waiting Time Database, and also an increasing uh, number of uh, naloxone kits being made available. So, some of these aspects can be measured, uh, but I think it's worth keeping in mind that they are partnerships uh, and we have to allow a level of flexibility in order to reflect local need. And I'll give way to Paul uh, Thank the Minister for, for giving way. Um, from, from his seat, from what he sees within the NHS, do, does he think he's getting enough senior people within the NHS committed to this job? Because it's a huge job that crosses many, many different departments and responsibilities in government. But do you think the NHS is pulling its weight? Minister. Well, uh, that was me coming to the next part, and that is around health. And I think in the health aspect, we can get uh, greater consistency uh, because of the nature of the way in which we <coughs> can configure health services here in Scotland. And I uh, have set out, um, uh, as uh, Rosanna Cunningham did, that um, I'm very clear that I want to see much greater leadership within the NHS in this area. And when I met with um, uh, primary and secondary health care teams um, a few weeks ago to discuss an aspect of this report, I am very clear that I expect all of the boards to have an accountable officer at a decision-making level in order to take responsibility and show leadership in this area of policy within individual boards. That work is now taking place and we are expecting all boards to demonstrate that and to come forward with the <coughs> right individual to do that. So there is more we can do uh, and I am determined to make sure we do that and that we have someone accountable for making sure that that happens. Whether that is the, uh, the Director of Public Health or whether, it's the, uh, whether it happens to be the Medical Director, I don't want to prescribe that, but we have to make sure that it's someone of sufficient seniority in order to make sure that we get the type of change that I think is uh, necessary. But maybe just to pick up on where I do think we can get greater improvement. And, you know, Elaine Murray and her contribution uh, made reference to, for example, getting access to psychological services. Um, you know, that can be challenging at times, and it has been challenging for many years. That's why we're bringing in the heat target uh, for psychological services, which will come into force as of December next year, which will allow us to make sure that we have a clear timeline for those who are referred to get access to those services. We've seen an increase in the level of psychological therapies being available across the country, and work to try and help to support more of that to take place is ongoing at this present time. But that's an example of, I think, where we can get greater consistency across the country by taking an approach where we set a very clear uh, standard at a, a national level. Can I also just pick up on the issue around uh, dealing with some of the health challenges that this report highlights? Because um, a key part of uh, dealing with uh, the health challenges also is to make sure that uh, GPs uh, are properly engaged in this process. Uh, and I, uh, would you call, uh, because primary care is absolutely central to how we deliver some aspects of the, uh, the challenges around the uh, uh, drug recovery model. <clears throat> Can I say, though, um, uh, there are some challenges in doing that, uh, because general practitioners are independent contractors. Uh, we have to look at how we can build that into the contract in a way, but to do that is not something which is in the gift of government just to say it's going to happen. We have to negotiate that with the profession and look at taking that type of issue uh, forward. It's on that basis, uh, and I'm keen to have a consensus in this debate, that uh, we are unable to accept the Labour amendment, not because of the main part of it, because of the final element around setting a time frame for some of these things to take place. I'm not in a position to be able to set a time frame where I'm going to be able to get that agreement with GPs at a national level. Um, I wish I was, uh, but the reality is that I'm not, and I think it would be false for me to give an indication that that would be uh, the case, other than to say 
it is on our agenda and it is part of the discussions which we are having. So um, it is not that I do not wish to or we do not wish to strike a, 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 a consensus in this matter, it is just simply a matter of fact that we are not able to set a specific time frame around this particular issue. I will give way to uh, Mr Finney. John Finney. Recognising the issue you say about a uh, general practitioner's minister, would you acknowledge that there would need to be a, a ministerial lead? So, on issues like prescribing heroin, supervised injection, and street drug testing, these are something that you would have to initiate. Minister, well, I, I think any in any of these types of issues taken on forward with GPs as part of the GMS contract have to be issues of negotiation, and we would have to explore what they would be. Um, uh, but as I say, um, uh, as a government, uh, they are very much on our agenda. Um, what we have to do is work with other colleagues to try and take them forward. Can I turn also uh, to the issue of uh, 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 the use of uh, prescribing through um, uh, our community pharmacy services? Well, Rennie made the point, I think, very importantly, is that community pharmacists, as did Jackson Carlow, community pharmacists play an extremely important part uh, in the jigsaw uh, around the recovery uh, model. I think it was unfortunate last year at uh, some of the publicity and the language around the methadone programme through our uh, community pharmacy provision. Uh, and thankfully, we have moved beyond that uh, uh, in moving forward. Uh, we published in September uh, Prescribing for Excellence, and a key part of that is about uh, developing and implementing NHS standards specifications around alcohol and drug services, particularly around uh, pharmaceutical uh, services, which will help us to drive forward improvements in standards in this area. And I think we all recognise that community pharmacies have a, an ongoing role to play in making sure that we can deliver an effective recovery model for drugs policy in Scotland. I know that um, around methadone, Mary Scanlon raised the issue about whether individuals who are on the methadone programme are tested on a monthly basis to see whether they are uh, complying with that. I, I appreciate the logic of that, but the nature of the recovery model is such that people often uh, slip back. Uh, and that type of approach to testing every month is a, a, a method which is recognised as not being valuable and it can undermine uh, the recovery model in itself. It is also very resource intensive and also it does not actually demonstrate much in the way of outcomes. But I do appreciate the point she is making. We need to make sure uh, that there are proper checks in the system. And that brings me to my final point, and that is the need to make sure that we measure what we are getting from the system. Graham Pearson is right. We need to make sure that we are very clear about what we get from uh, the drugs policy that we are pursuing. And the improvement methodology, which we are setting out as part of our response to this particular policy, will help us to achieve that. I believe, uh, uh, Officer, this report uh, helps to build on the good progress that has been made in recent years in Scotland around uh, drugs policy. The consensus that has been struck today uh, gives me strength in knowing that there is a joint effort across this chamber to make sure that we build on that progress. What I hope we have been able to demonstrate to members today is that both myself and Rosanna Cunningham are committed to making sure that we take that joint working right across government to build on the good progress we have been making. That concludes the debate on the independent expert review of opioid replacement therapies in Scotland. Point in order, Joanne Rallament. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Today at First Minister's question time, the First Minister said he had a letter from the EU Secretariat implying that an independent Scotland could apply for EU membership from within. He omitted to say a number of things of other things about the letter. He omitted to say that it goes on to undermine entirely the points the First Minister made. He omitted to say it was not a response from the EU Commission to the Scottish Government. He omitted to say as the First Minister's official spokesman confirmed this lunchtime, that they do not know who the letter was sent to, <laughs> what that person had asked, but instead that they had only found this random letter through a troll of the internet. <laughs> Presiding officer, I believe the First Minister's use of this letter was an attempt to deceive the Chamber and the Scottish people. Can the, can the presiding officer tell me if government by Google is in order? As a member is aware, and as I have said again and again as recently as yesterday, the presiding officer has never been, is not, and cannot be held responsible for the content of member speeches in the chamber. 
We now move to decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question, order. The first question is amendment number 8422.1 in the name of Elaine Murray, which seeks to amend motion number 8422 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on the independent expert review of opioid replacement therapies in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament okay. is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote of amendment number 8422.1 in the name of Elaine Murray is as follows. Yes, 43. No, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 8422 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on the independent expert review of opioid replacement therapies in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. I now close this meeting.